Well, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors meeting of February 27th, 2024. Um, I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Sure. Supervisor Koenig? Here. Friend? Here. Hernandez? Here. McPherson? Here. And Cummings? Here. Um, I'd like to ask if there's any uh, member of the board who would like to dedicate today's moment of silence. Okay, hearing none. Um, I'd like to dedicate the moment of silence to a, a student who sadly was um, murdered by her, her boyfriend uh, this past weekend at, at Seabright Beach. Um, just want to have our hearts go to her family and friends. Um, and would like to dedicate uh, the moment of silence to that individual whose name has not been released publicly. Thank you. Um, Vice Chair Hernandez, could you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to ask uh, CAO Palacios if there's been any late additions to the agenda or deletions. Uh, yes, Chair Cummings and members of the board. First, I'd like to announce that Chair Cummings is appearing remotely today um, under the just caused exemption due to illness. And he is, uh, there is no one else in his location. He is there alone. Uh, having announced that on the consent agenda, there's just one addition on item 21. There's additional materials. There's a new attachment, a letter of Mark Bingham, and that's inserted on package page 149. That concludes the uh, corrections. Thank you. Are there any board members uh, that would like to remove an item from the consent to the regular agenda? And I'll just go down the line um, since I'm not there in person. Supervisor Koenig? No, thank you. Supervisor Friend? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, thank you. Supervisor Hernandez? No. Thank you. Supervisor McPherson? No. No. Okay. With that, we will go ahead and open up uh, public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the or oral communications, my mistake. Uh, this is an opportunity for members of the public to comment on anything that's not on the agenda, or they may comment make comments on items that are on the agenda. Just noting that if you make a comment on items that are, are on the agenda, the regular or consent, that you may not make a comment on those items when they come forward um, later on in the presentation. And so with that, um, the first speaker can step up to the podium. <laughs> Hi, my name is Isabella Bonner. I want to thank the Board of Supervisors for presenting Black Surf Santa Cruz and myself with the proclamation today. Um, it's really a great honor and the work that we've been doing wouldn't be possible without the support of all of you. Um, so I'm going to read just a little excerpt from the proclamation. Um, Black Surf Santa Cruz is a California nonprofit founded in 2020 and incorporated in 2022 with a mission to promote physical, spiritual, and communal healing through surfing, recreation, education, and wellness. The county helped us work with, um, I worked with Manu and Justin to um, help shift the local surf school nonprofit application process um, and actually creating a separate nonprofit track so that organizations like Black Surf and organizations aiming to cut access barriers to our ocean and natural resources, um, really helping to give us the space to do so. So thank you so much for this honor today. Thank you, Bella. And I just want to um, acknowledge, you know, I met Ms. Bonner back in 2020 after the murder of George Floyd, and she's been very proactive at trying to make Santa Cruz a very just, um, inclusive, and diverse community where everyone feels welcome. And uh, really thought it fitting, given that it's Black History Month, that we acknowledge and honor the work that she's been doing around making surfing in particular a much more open and inclusive space in Santa Cruz community. So um, just wanted to thank you for all your hard work and then wanted to see if there's any other supervisors who want to make comments at this time. Yes, Chair, I'll add a few comments. I Mostly just congratulating Bella on all her hard work. 
you know, I can't imagine a better response to or or way to embody the Black Lives Matter movement here in Santa Cruz than uh, bringing more uh, people of color to uh, experience and enjoy our surfing community here. Uh, and of course, I think you ran head on into, you know, here in Santa Cruz, we we often think, oh, we don't have uh, issues with race and exclusion or very inclusive. Um, but the reality is um, that we do still have work to do. Mm -hmm. And of course you have run into some of that head on. And uh, I think ultimately some of the program changes we've made to give you your own, um, well, a, a nonprofit uh, surf school license will ultimately um, it helps just officialize your presence and honor all the good work that you're doing, um, but also make sure that the entire community recognizes um, that our waves are a place for everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank and you. Our supervisors. Hearing none, um, we'll invite the next speaker to the podium. Good morning. My name is Penny Ellis, and I'm the Santa Cruz lead for Bill AB 626, which is item number 29 on your meeting agenda for today. And I'm here today to bring you up to date on where we currently stand on implementing AB 626. To date, 13 counties have opted in, which includes neighboring Santa Clara County and Monterey County. Last September, with a unanimous vote uh, in support of Zach Brand and Bruce McPherson's offices, uh, the board directed environmental health to look into drafting an ordinance for a two-year pilot program and return before or by January 12th with their report. Environmental health needed a little more time for that, and the date was pushed back to today, which is five months later. I'm here today to stress the importance of our county government proceeding in a timely and efficient manner in order to stay on track for receiving state approved grant funding. Part of this multi-million dollar funding is earmarked specifically to assist the Department of Environmental Health offices with operational costs needed to get the bill up and running. And furthermore, we're committed to partnering with our DA Department of Environmental Health and offering the technical and financial support needed to draft an ordinance. Now is the time to take action to get the funding and technical support that our DAEH needs to implement this bill. The focus of AB66 has always been to empower people who want to cook and sell meals to our community with a safe and affordable legal path country. So when you come to item 29 on today's agenda, I encourage you to take seriously your role in leading our county government towards an efficient timeline that honors all the hard work and dedication of the numerous citizens, local businesses, and organizations that continue to support this important bill. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ann Thrift. I live in Boulder Creek in a cell dead zone, and this is about AT&T. I'm a semi-retired technology reporter specialized in electronics and telecom. After 40 years of listening to hype like AT&T's been giving us, I can tell you they're trying to deceive us with carefully chosen words in a misleading map. They claim no copper landline customer will be left without phone service. Obviously, that won't be true if they abandon their carry of last resort obligation, especially because there's no designated other carrier that is forced to guarantee us home phone service. Right now, that only means copper landlines. There are no better technologies, no reliable alternatives in rural and mountainous California, especially during our frequent power outages. AT&T's map shows who they won't abandon now in purple and who they say have reliable alternatives in blue. But many landline customers like me in blue don't have any alternatives. So why is the map wrong and where's their data? Just because you can sell me a service at my home doesn't mean it will work there. In addition, all other communication technologies depend on PG&E's power. That's how AT&T got Kohler in the first place based on reliable copper lines. AT&T wants us to think copper landlines are outdated, dying dinosaur tech. Really? Then why is high-speed VDSL broadband steadily increasing in Europe over copper lines? Technologies do not evolve, but companies do make business decisions. And AT&T wants us to co-sign theirs. Their problem getting parts and service workers is not our problem. That's their cost of doing business. 
With their deep pockets, they can afford to build their own parts and train their own techs. Instead of paying way too many big salaried executives and PR firms to give us yet more deceptive patronizing speeches. Thank you for your time. Good morning, I'm Allison Andrews. I'm uh, the Valley Women's Club president at the moment. I'm here to express our concern about AT&T proposed uh, hard, hardwire landlines being removed and uh, also our internet issues. The Valley Women's Club has about 500 uh, members who are all living in the rural area of the San Lorenzo Valley. We're a strong and resilient lot, as you know, we go out with our own saws and hammers, et cetera. And, uh, but we need to be just supported by the infrastructure and by you, the county. Uh, my, our concerns are mostly for the students and our elderly. Uh, the day, this day and age, the students have to have internet, not need it, they have to have it. But absolutely no internet access is available during these storms and children are out there trying to learn. And of course we have to have the home learning, the research, the development, and of course the curiosity for the children to be on the internet. Our seniors need to have a way to get help. No matter what the circumstances are, whether it's fire, floods, they need to be able to reach somebody. That's what our hard lines are for. We have one, it just went up 30% yesterday when I got the bill, I'm shocked. Uh, I'm concerned about uh, the hardwares that can actually bring the DSL and they're trying to take those out. And I'm concerned about uh, the emergency system, whether it will still work if we don't have hardwires up there and better cell service. We need more cell service. There are areas where there actually is a total uh, blank in the area, like in Ben Lomond. So we appreciate your support of keeping them in. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Kristen Sandell. I'm a resident of Ben Lomond and also a Valley Women's Club member. And as a 30 year resident of the San Lorenzo Valley, I'm very much opposed to any ending of landline service which is a critical safety net for many of us. Cell service in the mountains is unreliable, even when the power is on. We don't have broadband or fiber optic. And even if we did, in a power outage, natural disaster, or extreme weather event, landlines are often our only way to call for help in an emergency. The landline functions when nothing else works. My neighbors know that they can use my landline when their cell phones don't work. So a landline can literally be a lifesaver for a whole neighborhood, not just one household. And we aren't even in a particularly isolated area. We are 20 minutes from downtown and we still face huge power and connectivity issues. So I wanna say thank you for contacting the CPUC to oppose this and please continue to represent your constituents on this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Mary Magaña Ayala and I'm the Semitas Program Coordinator here at Ventures. I am here today to spread awareness of the Semitas Program, which invests in Santa Cruz County babies' educational future by automatically opening a college savings account. Eligible babies born after January 1st, 2021 to Santa Cruz County residents receive an initial deposit of up to $50 at the time of birth. As the baby grows, they receive additional deposits based on health and educational milestones. Our goals are to increase childhood development, build expectations for higher education, and build dedicated savings and healthy lifelong financial habits. To date, Semitas has opened over 7,000 accounts, which has been possible with the help of our many partners. More than half of our participants are from the Pajaro Valley. 60% of the population we serve is Latine and 36% are white. More than half of the families we serve have received an equalizer deposit to their baby's account of an additional $25 at the time of birth because they have Medi-Cal or their self-reported income is below 70,000. Semitas wouldn't have been possible without the generosity of our many partners. We would like to thank all of our partners for investing in our Santa Cruz County children. Thank you for your time. Thank you and thank you for the work you do in our community.
Uh, good morning, Board of Supervisors. Thank you for your service. My name is Shalot Cabanas, and I love Santa Cruz. Um, first, I'm here just to represent myself. Um, uh, every I want to say thank you to Bruce McPherson and Zach Friend for your many years of service. Um, we all have battles that we struggle through every day that other people don't know about. Those with us who struggle with behavior, health, mental health issues, there's an added component. I have to say in public settings that I've been in, Zach Friend has often come up to me, greeted me and, and checked it and, and given me words of encouragement. And from one human being to another, thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. The other reason I'm here is I have the privilege of serving as the chairperson for the Mental Health Advisory Board. And uh, as you've seen in your packet, we've been pretty prolific in turning things in. One thing we've done is the data notebook. It's turned that into the state. We also um, have a letter to uh, recommend the resolution to support the property tax uh, appropriation report uh, reform. Uh, also a recommendation for the behavioral health crisis response and a um, recommendation to oppose proposition one, which would take a lot of funding away from behavioral health, even though it's uh, intent is really good. It also takes away future control of that funding from us voters and brings it up to the state level. So we uh, strongly support that, um, strongly oppose that. Um, finally, uh, we'll be turning in the biannual report soon and uh, make an appointment to do any kind of reporting or answer any kind of questions you have. Have. Again, guys, thank you so much for your service. I love Santa Cruz. Thank you. Hello, I'm Laura Chatham, and I am on the Mental Health Advisory Board. And I just came to read the letter out loud um, to oppose Proposition One. So this says to Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors, the Mental Health Advisory Board of Santa Cruz County strongly recommends that Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors oppose Proposition 1 as it reduces funding for existing behavioral health services and crisis response. Proposition 1 diverts one-third of the existing funds funding from the voter-approved Mental Health Services Act funding allows many kinds of services to compete with mental health care for the remaining money and puts the state in charge of local behavioral health programs and decisions. The results will be devastating at the local level. Current Mental Health Services Act programs are a lifeline for underserved communities and people without insurance. Many of these services will be cut due to Proposition 1 if it passes. Again, the Mental Health Advisory Board of Santa Cruz County strongly recommends that Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors oppose Proposition 1 as it reduces funding for existing behavioral health services and crisis response. Please do not hesitate to, to contact us if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, esteemed members of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. I am Martin, an apprentice with the Sheet Metal Workers Local 104, representing GOH Wilson. I join my fellow apprentices in urging your support for a project labor agreement with a million dollar threshold. PLAs are essential for promoting stability, fair wages, and crucial benefits like health care and retirement plans. By endorsing this agreement, you are investing in the growth and prosperity of both our community and the skilled workers of Sheet Metal Local 104. Thank you. Um, greetings, honorable members of the Board of Supervisors. I, Sebastian, as an apprentice affiliated with the Sheet Metal Local 104, employed by Air Tech Service, which we do a lot of work around here, if not almost all of it. Strongly advocate for your support in establishing a project labor agreement with the million dollar threshold in Santa Cruz. PLA is not only foster collaboration between contractors and labor, but also provide vital benefits such as health care, retirement plans, and much more to workers. Your endorsement will undoubtedly contribute to the success of our local projects and the well-being of our skilled workforce. Thank you. Good morning. How you guys doing? 
Respected members of the Santa, Car uh, excuse me, Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors, my name is Jaime Baquera. I'm an instructor at Sheet Metal Workers Local 104, uh, JATC, where we train the next generation of skilled workers. I stand before you in support of implementing a, a project labor agreement with a million dollar threshold in our county. As educators, we strive to equip the apprentices with the highest skill and dedication. A PLA not only ensures a fair compensation and benefits uh, for our apprentices, including healthcare retirement plans, uh, but also uh, play a crucial role in fostering a collaborative and stable working environment. This agreement not only benefits our skilled workforce, but contributes to the success of local projects. Your support for a PLA will resonate beyond the job sites, positively impacting education and training we provide at Sheet Metal Workers JATC. It reinforces the value of skilled labor and promotes a sustainable future for both workers and the project in our projects in our community. Thank you for considering the importance of a project labor agreement and looking forward to witnessing the positive impact it can have on sheet metal worker local 104 apprentices, their future employers, and the broader Santa Cruz County community. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for letting us speak. I'm also an apprentice with 104. Uh, Jaime is one of our instructors. Uh, we encourage you to help try to get us a PLA. I think it helps. I know me as an apprentice, um, being a single father, helping my son go to school, play sports, stay in the community. Thank you to Jaime for helping us learn the skills of the trade, having pride in our work, being able to take my son out here and say, I built that, I built that. It's just, it feels good when, you're, when your son can say, oh, my dad built that or my uncle built that. You know, something they can see, something that they can be proud of. Uh, it's okay to work with your hands. It's okay to, you know, be out there, help the community flourish, help it benefit. We build schools, mm -hmm. hospitals, local police stations. And I'm very thankful to be able to do that for the area and where I live. Being able to, like they say, keep money here for me and my son. Thank you for your time. Good morning. Dear members of the Board of Supervisors, I am Jose Mancia, a proud apprentice with the Sheet Metal Workers Local 104, working at Val's Plumbing and Heating. I appeal to you for your support in implementing a project labor agreement with a million dollar threshold in Santa Cruz County. PLAs bring stability to projects, ensuring timely completion and cost effectiveness. Additionally, they guarantee fair compensation and essential benefits for workers such as myself. Your endorsement of a PLA will strengthen both our local projects and the skilled workforce within our community. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I am addressing today not only the board, whom I thank for your support regarding the AT&T issue. Um, I have lived in Santa Cruz since 1972, and I survived the 89 earthquake. Um, AT&T might not be aware that, hey, this is earthquake country. We're talking not only Santa Cruz County, but California. So. I hope to survive the big one, which is supposedly coming. Scientists have said this year, as early as this year. For the 89 earthquake, I was in Soquel and our landline held up. We were able to contact relatives, friends, housemates to see how they were doing, to see if what if the bridge collapsed, what roads were open? This is most definitely landlines are lifelines. So I appeal to you to um, consider not what money at and is going to be, um, you know, um, acquiring as a result of this, um, but to look at the big picture. 
Also, I might say that personally, I cannot be around, oops, I cannot be around um, electromagnetic frequency that comes from the cell phone. Uh, it's very debilitating to me, to my health, to my mind. So there it is. Um, if the corporation has a conscience, they should use it. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Judy Rosella Myers, and I live in an incorporated Santa Cruz County. I want to thank you all for all your service and all you guys do to represent your constituents all over the county. And please do not take the side of the corporation in terms of the landline situation. It is important to know, I also was here during the 89 quake. And again, the landline was the savior. There was no other way to get a hold of people or for people to get a hold of us. And I know people who have cell coverage who right now, this very day, in different parts of their house, AT&T does not provide good enough coverage. And this is an area that is highly populated in Pleasure Point. So it's not consistent to have cell coverage from AT&T. And AT&T, it's a conflict of interest. They are in the cell phone business and trying to push off high tech, not technology, because they don't want to pay the service people, you know, who are trained, just like the sheet workers who actually provide a major service for our community. So those are the guys who hold it all together. So please, please help us maintain the self, the um, landline coverage that we need for all of our community, not just the mountains. I mean, we're not getting coverage even within our areas that are supposed to be covered. So please, thank you. Represent us all, not AT and T. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, members of the board. My name is Alejandra Garcia. I am I serve as a new government affairs manager for Comcast. I will oversee in my role the support of broadband issues and efforts for both Santa Cruz and Monterey County. I am here today to express Comcast's dedication in partnering with the county in advancing broadband infrastructure and connectivity for the residents of Santa Cruz County. With Comcast's extensive experience in telecommunication and our commitment to innovation, we are eager to work alongside the county to ensure that all residents have access to reliable and high-speed broadband services. For over a decade, Comcast has been focused on closing the digital divide. Most recently with our Live Zone Partners Community Bridges in Santa Cruz County. I eagerly anticipate collaborating closely with the county board and other stakeholders to improve broadband access and connectivity along the region. Should you, your team, or the residents of Santa Cruz County require any assistance from Comcast, please don't hesitate to contact us. I look forward to working together. Thank you. Hi there, good morning. My name is Kathy Ashramoff. I'm a resident of Bonnie Doon. Um, Bonnie Dune is about 45 minutes from Silicon Valley, but you wouldn't know it. Thank you. Bonnie Dune is about 45 minutes from Silicon Valley, but you wouldn't know it by the fact that we don't have cell phone service and that Comcast regularly goes out uh, when the power goes out. Um, I'm really glad to hear the prior speaker commit to um, better Comcast service in, uh, in Santa Cruz. Perhaps they would like to become the carrier of last resort for the county if AT&T is backing out. Um, needless to say, I'm here to talk about AT&T. Um, landline is essential for public safety in Bonnie Doon. Multiple prior speakers have said so, so I won't repeat that. Um, relieving AT&T of their carrier of last resort obligation would create another hole in the infrastructure safety net that myself and Bonnie Doon and my family and my neighbors rely upon. Um, uh, you, I don't have to tell you all about what happened, especially uh, Supervisor McPherson in the uh, 2020 uh, lightning fires. Um, landline was um, a lifeline um, afterwards for weeks and weeks and weeks, oh, sorry. Um, 
I want to thank the uh, Board of Supervisors uh, for your uh, writing the letter to the CPUC, uh, advocating for that, um, for this action to be uh, advo advocating that um, ATT maintain their carry of last resort. Um, they claim that their colo um, colo obligations limit their ability to compete, which I find hilarious. What they aren't talking about is the fact that for decades uh, they benefited as a monopoly. Um, from taking on that obligation, and they didn't have any competition at all during that period. If they can't compete today, maybe they should work on better serving their customers, not whining to regulators about an obligation that benefited them for decades. Please listen to the at t speaker today with the skepticism that they deserve. Thank you. Yep. Uh, good morning. My name is Barry Porter. I live on Fair Road in Bonnie Dune, and I'd also um, oppose AT&T's move to uh, to get out of the landline business. But on a different subject, uh, supervisors may be aware of a new effort in Watsonville to limit aircraft operations at the Watsonville Airport. The city's motivation is to reduce or eliminate runway safety zones to facilitate um, development, land development near the airport. Um, this effort will reduce the safety of the airport and its utility by closing or drastically reducing access to critical runway and also encourages conflicting development that will inevitably increase pressure to close the airport. Although the airport's within the city of Watsonville owned by it, it's a vital asset to the region and the county especially. Um, Watsonville City Council plans to vote on proposals to close or significantly shorten the crosswind runway. Um, at a meeting on March 26th, the Watsonville Pilots Association supports a compromise that uh, exists of shortening the runway by approximately 870 feet. This resolves FAA um, line of sight issues that have been raised, and it opens up additional land for development in Watsonville. But shortening the runway beyond this or closing it altogether would have a negative impact on the airport safety, county emergency services and the $67 million worth of revenue that is brought in through the airport each year. It's the only public airport, and it's important to the city and the county as an operational hub in instances such as the Loma Prieta earthquake, CCU fire, recent flooding is incredibly important. Watsonville's need to accommodate new housing is also very important, but a compromise should be made to create the housing and protect and preserve the area's only operating airport. Consequently, uh, we'd hope that the county would participate in future city discussions and represents the region's need to protect the Watsonville Airport. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Martin Garcia. And I am with the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades. We have many members who reside in this county. So I urge your support uh, for the adoption of a project labor agreement with a million dollar threshold. PLAs not only ensure fair wages, but also provide comprehensive benefits, including healthcare and retirement plans. To workers, by endorsing this agreement, you are contributing to the prosperity of our local projects and the skilled workforce that builds and shapes our community. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Daniel Ferreira. I'm an apprentice at Geo Wilson. I ask you to support a PLA at a million dollars with a five-year term. This PLA will help me personal, personally with my future hours in this county. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Philip Trumpman. I'm here to talk about at and I currently have a landline with a DSL. I get reliable phone service when power is out. I get 2.4 megabits per second internet service and use a wireless router and use a generator when my power is out and I get it all. I can use cordless telephone system and have service where I select in my home. My wife and I do not have to lug a phone around from room to room nor buy two expensive ones. If AT&T wants to drop the landline, we should at the minimum get 99 point plus reliability phone service that accommodates cordless telephone technology. And I don't need two phones for my wife and I, okay? Frankly, as meager it is, it, the internet should provide a minimum of 20 megabytes 
bits per second and a wireless router for distribution. AT&T has 580,000 people involved in this situation. It's an opportunity for them to improve what they have, which they haven't. And uh, they can make more money off this than they can throwing us out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, my name is John Lars. I'm here for the same AT&T issue. I'm asking the county to take up this case on behalf of this class of people. I, I am a farmer in Mr. Freen's district uh, down San Andreas Road. I have about 800 employees that work there on the farm. We have two DSL nodes on copper, remote rural areas. We have an HR office. We have workman's compensation cases. We have health insurance claims, various data passing between these nodes over to our other node, also in Aptos at Seascape Village, where we do have Comcast. However, Comcast wants a quarter million dollars, for example, to get Kay Holcomb's connection up there off of up above uh, the freeway. To get my connection, Comcast probably cost me another 150, 200,000 to get the cable. We're talking a quarter mile run, which is nothing for a farmer. I'm asking you to take the case up for the class. The telco intransigence is historically known. That's why they have to have PUC in their offices overseeing what they do. PUC is not taking the call. The letter, AT&T letter, notice of intent, gives me a number to call PUC. PUC's answering machine tells me to call PG&E's standard number. You wait an hour and a half to get service for ordinary service for AT&T. It's a problem, it's a serious problem. Rural internet is very important and it's not there yet. I'm really, I'm, this is a big issue for me. They're charging me $1,000 a month for a single copper line to one of these nodes where we connect by wireless Wi-Fi for three miles to get to the other node where we do not have DSL. We have nothing. That's where our hiring office is and that's where we've been doing business. We have copper there, landline. We can talk on the phone. Um, thank, thank you so much, sir. Good morning. Uh, my name is Joe Alba. I'm a retired uh, sheet metal worker with uh, Local 104. Uh, I'm also a part-time instructor. I started in the sheet metal back in 1982 when I graduated uh, Watsonville High School. And by supporting uh, the PLL, that's what I'm here for, uh, you will also provide these younger boys, boys, men, because <laughs> these men that have come up prior to me uh, to, to uh, have a good uh, career and more importantly, we look forward to a re nice retirement like I, I am enjoying right now. So by supporting the PLL, you will also ensure work for them. And by them working, they're supporting my retirement and hopefully keeping this whole system going where we can uh, provide good living wages, especially in this area that we know is so expensive and which has allowed me to live still in the area because of the work and the pensions that I received. So I urge your support for the project labor agreement. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Billy Butler. I'm an iron worker at a local 377. Been an iron worker for 19 years. I'm a part-time instructor for the past five. I'm from Santa Cruz County. So I grew up in the beach flats. And since I've joined the union, it's helped me get a house, a truck, my own family to go home to every day. The furthest I've worked was out of state, but I've never had a job, PLA-wise, home-wise, where I can say, hey, take my kid and show her all my kids and say, hey, I built that. I got to go to the Golden Gate and beyond. So it would be nice to have something here and to bring back to our community because I have a big research, research, re. Oh. Outreach. So we reach out to, on my days off, I go to the schools and go talk to any of the kids to help them try to join a union. Kids that are invested and want to learn about unions. So I'm just here to show support for the PLS. 
Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I arrived late. I have a question. Did you pull consent agenda item 21? No. All right. Thank you. Then I will speak on that now. Um, item consent agenda item 21 is the uh, next generation county radio uh, project that will cost uh, perhaps $49 million. I was hoping you would pull that so there could be better discussion publicly. The, the taxpayers are going to be asked to, to fund that unfunded federal mandate, but um, it, I have a lot of questions. Is it really going to improve service during emergency emergencies and disasters for emergency response workers in the rural areas? I am troubled that it will completely eliminate the citizen's ability to use scanners. Those are important for people to be able to listen to during disasters because they can hear what is going on and information is critical. So um, I hope that you will take a look at doing that and answer my emails that I have sent. Um, item number 42 listed in the agenda, but item 41 in the book outside is the Aptos Village Area Traffic Adaptive System. Um, almost a half a million dollars in adapting and coordinating the traffic lights through Aptos Village from State Park to Trout Gulch. That was all supposed to have been done when Swenson built the phase one of the Aptos Village project. And now I see phase two coming in and it is going to get even more congested. That's part of why I'm late this morning. I ask that you um, hold the developer accountable to paying for this system that the Aptos Village project traffic is bringing about in part. Um, and I urge voters to vote no on K. You have to learn to be on a budget just like we do. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Jonathan Whitwer. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yep. Uh, now that I've leaned back, maybe you can't, but uh, I have a handout here that I want. I'm here. I live in Bonnie Dune area, and uh, I have a handout that I would like to provide. Um, and it's uh, a document that is uh, that I got from the Public Advocates, uh, the, which is an independent division of the CPUC. I'm here to talk about AT&T item, and uh, it is their handout uh, in terms of what the problems are, and the, and the public advocates are very, very concerned about AT&T's application, and, and you'll be able to see the highlights uh, on that uh, document, which is a document provided not only by the public advocates, but uh, it, it was filed in the proceeding that AT&T has, has filed. Uh, along with uh, TURN, which you're probably familiar with, the uh, Reform Network, Utility Reform Network organization. There's also the Center for Accessible Technology that is filing this. The Rural County Representatives of California is filing this, which is 40 counties. Uh, Santa Cruz County is not uh, a member of that, neither is Santa Clara or San Mateo. But I'm wondering if uh, your board could... Uh, sorry, find a way to piggyback on the rural counties uh, uh, filing and also the Tahoe Energy Ratepayers Organization. I'll just say that I personally have, on a number of occasions, been in the situation where I didn't have any way to reach emergency services when the power goes out and if AT&T is out. But more, most of the time, AT&T survives, as you've heard, and that has been the lifesaver. So to me personally, it's very important that AT&T continue to be an emergency provider. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Patricia Dameron. I live on the North Coast between Western Drive and Davenport. Um, and during the 2020 fires, uh, the Comcast equipment that gives me Wi-Fi um, melted and uh, there was a roadblock at Highway 1 in Western Drive, so I couldn't go to town because if I tried to come back, I wouldn't be able to go through the roadblock and take care of my animals 
and help out my elderly neighbors as I was doing during the fire. So for about seven days in August 2020, I had no way to communicate or get emergency services except my AT&T landline, which worked great. So um, I know there are a lot of people in that same boat, and I really urge the um, supervisors to go to bat for for our community to AT and T to um, to keep the service for us for for emergency. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is James Ewing Whitman. I looked around. I was really hoping that uh, Sheriff Hart was in the room to be much more candid about the things I would like public commentary about and public involvement. You know, the on the regular agenda, the AT and T items coming up. So the 10 people that spoke on it, I hope they stick around to listen to what was said. Now, I don't know why anybody, if they do their own research, would pledge allegiance to the corporate pirate flags of the United States or California or the pedophile flag. People should do their own research. You know, although I can thank all of you men for many things, there's another side to that coin. This document in my hand about city and county managers, they control the city council members and the boards of supervisors. You, you men, the supervisors were elected. Neither the civilization obliteration assistant, Mr. Carlos Palacios, or Jason Heath were elected, but they are controlling this board. And so there's a lot of issues going on that aren't really being spoken about. And I would be much more candid if Mr. Hart was here. Thank you. Well, good morning. I'm not here to talk about phones or anything else. So uh, I'm glad to be here. Hi, my name is Stoney Brook, and I'm the here's the representative for our United Veterans Council of Santa Cruz County. And I'm in support of item 31, which is our consent agenda item about the veterans building lease in Watsonville, the city of Watsonville. Our council met and gave 100% support of this proposal. I want to thank each of the board members who worked with us on making this happen. UVC represents approximately 9,500 veterans or dependents and families. In our county, through over two dozen veteran organizations and nonprofit service providers. Each of those members have a vote and a voice. Um, the proposed lease marks a milepost, not the finish line, and a 10 year journey to develop and offer better services to our veterans in the South County, especially in Watsonville. Traditionally, an underserved and often neglected population are South County residents have a long and compelling history of military service in the United States dating before the Civil War. Um, I'm gonna cut right to the chase here in the interest of time. And just say I'd like to thank Supervisor Felipe Hernandez and his staff, awesome folks, for making this come together. Thank you very much. I particularly like to take note of Rebecca Hurley from our county parks department. Because without Rebecca, who kept us on task and on track, we probably would still be sitting in a meeting room somewhere with carpal tunnel butt. So uh, she's the consummate professional. She was able to navigate the rocks and shoals and keep us on time. And she did this with respect, patience, and incredible sense of duty. Thank you all for your service. Thank you. Yes, um, my name is Martin Levy. I'm a resident downtown on River Street, a condo near the Gateway Plaza. And I'm going to address the AT&T issue just with some extra information. This is not only a rural issue, but it also affects uh, a lot more places. Um, AT&T presently is in the street outside us with their fiber option. The fiber option is mentioned in the large package for this meeting. And, and yet we cannot order that uh, service. We're downtown. We are not rural. It is just not available. Um, we also, by the way, can't even order AT&T uh, DSL over copper. Uh, at the moment, that has been withdrawn by AT&T. I provide this just as background information. So this is a downtown location, not a rural location. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, uh, uh, we have other fiber, local fiber providers, but 
they've stopped 60 feet beforehand and want a large amount of money to move. This is something that you should keep into account when you hear about other providers. We have Comcast, we're downtown, that's fine, but that's a zero, it has zero competition. Um, finally, yes, we have Starlink if you have a good space to look up at the sky. Um, downtown, that's not really an option for most people, obviously. Um, it works for me because I'm on the top floor. I can see the sky, that's it. Um, but I just want you to understand that that's not only an issue rurally. Um, in fact, actually downtown at the moment, AT&T has essentially at best one bar in our area, which is ironically where the AT&T sales office is at Gateway Plaza. Um, don't worry, T-Mobile has zero um, and, and Verizon isn't much better. So this is not only a rural issue. Keep all these issues into account, please. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. Hello, I'm Catherine Zucker. I live in Bonnie Dune also. I live at the bottom of a mountain with hundreds and hundreds of redwoods on top of me. Um, we've relied on AT&T for our entire residency there. It has served us in the CZU fires and other times. Uh, just recently, though, it uh, was down for nine days on my particular driveway. Um, it is not uh, cheap, um, but the other alternatives are also many, many, many of thousands and thousands of dollars in investments if they work at all. Um, I live with my husband. Uh, when the power is down, that is the only way, and the power is down often, as you all know, that is the only way we have ever been able to keep in touch, to have 911 services, to call Bonnie Dune Fire Department. It is absolutely essential. And it's also essential that at t stop gouging us and telling us that, oh, you can't be eligible for UVerse, so you're basically SOL. Right. And we're not going to support these lines. I spend about an hour and a half per month on the phone on hold with AT&T for various issues. And each time I get a different answer, each time I get the runaround and each bill is higher and higher. So this is an issue that is so important to our rural communities. And as he just mentioned, the downtown community. and. Um, it's just time for big corporations like at t just to stop squeezing us and to think about public safety for our communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you for being here for us. Um, I'm Barbara Dimitrick and I live in Bonnie Dune also. And I agree with what everyone one has already said about the lines in Bonnie Dune. I've lived there for 47 years, raised three children, and my AT&T line has been completely my lifeline on so many occasions, I can't tell you. When the power's down, my AT&T line has always worked. We're having less and less luck with it being <clears throat> in good shape, um, but it's still working. And I am here today because my AT&T line worked during the fires in Bonnie Dune. I received the reverse call at night. I was sound asleep, awakened, telling me to get out of there. I drove out of my dead end one way road just in time as the wall of fire came up in front of me. So I am here today to say we cannot be without our landlines. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Teresa Bond. Um, I am a trustee for the Los Gatos Saratoga Union High School District, which has a large quantity of students that live in the mountains that attend it. Um, I live in the fifth district of unincorporated county on the summit in the mountains. Today is the 11th consecutive day. It started on February 16th, the frontier internet outage. Our school district was on winter break last week and our families got the special experience of having a digital detox. This week, our students are back in class and they are utilizing our libraries to access their assignments and turn in their homework. This is the way we regularly live 
We also experienced power outages last week. Uh, we were out probably six days. Uh, at this point, we have quite a log. It is important to point out that it appears over the last two years, AT&T deprioritized maintenance on our landlines, resulting in poor reception and months of outage. Uh, this is new. In previous years, we experienced exceptional service. If a company with the COFERS of AT&T wants to abandon the expense of maintaining landlines for rural areas, it is ludicrous that to anticipate that some smaller company with much lower revenues would be able to take on this work. Rural, company, rural customers need landline service in the event of climate emergencies, health emergencies. We have a toddler who wears a backpack for chemo on our road, and she absolutely needs to be able to have emergency services. And personal safety, domestic violence. Uh, that occurs during power outages. We need our landlines. I just, thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning. My name is David Schwartz. I'm a candidate for supervisor district two. Just a few things that I'd like to mention this morning. I really like the fact that there's is a full house today and it's great that our um, community has an opportunity to speak to the board i would suggest that the board consider having their meetings uh, at different times as well to maybe have more public comment uh, maybe even having it at a different location if we do have a south county uh, county area uh, we could probably utilize that at certain times but think about possibly um, nine o'clock meetings sometimes maybe six o'clock meetings of uh, uh, pm uh, other times and um, let's let's keep this um, let's keep this commentary going uh, the other thing that I'd like to mention is I am in um, agreement with the PLA, but the one that you have on your agenda is uh, too cumbersome, too difficult to uh, deal with, and it's going to have un, uh, unintended consequences, I believe. I think the idea was to make the process simpler, but I believe the way this is written, it's not going to do that. So um, in support of that, we need to look at simplifying it and making it a, a document that uh, people can work with and um, it, it gives us the benefits that we desire. Without uh, without doing that, I, I don't think it's gonna be really a big help. Um, I, I love driving in today. Uh, it was a challenge to get across the county in an hour. There's so much going on. I like to see that. Um, it, it's nice that we're doing some work on uh, roads and things and we need to keep at it. I'm a little concerned about the financials of the county and I, I read through them this morning and it, I thought it was interesting that even though we're ahead of the curve on expenditures that it has no fiscal impact. I think it does have some impact, not much, but some. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Jamie Prophet. I live in Bonnie Dune as well. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your service and uh, I wanted to say that, you know, a little, we take care of uh, my mother-in-law who's uh, 93 and we had a, uh, an emergency about a little more than a month ago where we had to call 911 and thankfully there was a great response. Everything worked out. She's doing fine, giving me trouble. But uh, I want to say that the AT&T uh, is a huge concern. We live in the Redwoods like other people here and, um, uh, do whatever you can to uh, please have them keep service. Uh, otherwise, you know, cell for, we get cell service maybe one, two days a week for lucky. And uh, that's just the way it is. I, I appreciate your help on this and thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, my name's Dee Murray. And I just want to reiterate what's been said and thank the board for sticking up for us. Landlines save lives. Thank you very much. Thank you. And before the next speaker, is there any other member of the public who is there in person who would like to speak to us? If so, I'd like to just ask you to line up. Otherwise, if you're the last person who's speaking to us in person, we'll then transfer to people who are online. 
I just have a quick question. Will will there be an opportunity to speak when the AT and T issue is up again? Great. If yeah. So um. So if you've already spoken, you won't get a second chance to speak. But if you're going to wait to hear from AT and T and you haven't spoken yet, you will have a chance to speak uh, after AT and T gives their presentation. And so seeing uh, no other individuals in person, uh, I'd like to see if there's any uh, members of the public who are um, online who'd like to speak to us during oral communications. Yes, Chair, we have speakers. Caller user one, your microphone is now available. Marilyn Garrett. Uh, since Santa Cruz County imposed lockdowns and COVID shots on our population, the resulting negative consequences ought to be widely publicized and halt any future injections. Uh, I have before me the publication Wise Traditions, winter of 2023 titled COVID jabs. The bad news about COVID shots just keeps accumulating. In the UK, the Office of National Statistics published an update on deaths by vaccination status in England, which revealed that the vaccinated population accounted for 95% of the COVID-19 deaths during the 12 months from June 2022 through May 2023. 94% of those deaths were among either the triple or quadruple vaccinated population, while the unvaccinated accounted for the lowest number of COVID deaths in every single month. ExposeNews.com, November 19, 2023. And it's not just COVID that is carrying off the vaccinated. Physicians are describing a surge in aggressive, rapid onset cancers following the rollout of the shots in December 2020, especially lymphoma, even in young people. Epoch Times, August 15, 2023. Cardiovascular deaths in the U.S. and U.K. are up also. Vigilantevox.substack, August 2023. And disability rates in the UK have almost doubled. Most alarming of all is the damage inflicted on military members forced to take the COVID jabs. Um, I'm, I know I'm out of time here. You can check this out further, westonaprize.org. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Caller user two, your microphone's now available. Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you, Council, for your letter to AT&T supporting our landline availability. Um, I, I also live in town. Uh, I live in the unincorporated area, but it's definitely in, um, in, in not, not the rural part of our county. And um, we do not have the fiber optic um, alternative here. Uh, it is not available. And I want to keep my landline. I value my landline for safety reasons and for um, other reasons. I don't, I cannot use a cell phone. Um, and I also, I don't think people should be forced to use cell phones, especially not after the, can you hear me? I don't know if I'm, I heard problem there. But anyway, not after the um, United States Court of Appeals and the D.C. Circuit published its decision on August 13, 2021, that the FCC failed to consider <laughs> the evidence regarding the adverse health effects of wireless technology uh, all the way back to FCC's 1996 radio frequency emission guidelines that were supposed to be protecting the public health all this time and do not. So that court determined that FCC has to go back and redo all of their um, guidelines. And um, because they, that court was presented with 10,000 pages, actually 11,000 pages 
of evidence of harm to people and um, biological systems um, from wireless technology. So wireless technology is not the answer in this county. Um, fiber optics might be, but they're a long ways away from getting that. And fiber optics also go out during a power outage, so they would not address that, those concerns. Um, I'm puzzled why AT&T isn't simply having somebody else take over. If they don't want to deal with it anymore, why don't they have um, CenturyLink take over? Their Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. We appreciate them. Jeffrey and Stacy, your microphone's now available. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Jeff. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jeffrey Arlt. I'm the secretary of the Mental Health Advisory Board, and I'd like to speak to the written correspondence listing, Section 3, Item BB, which is the letter of recommendation um, to clarify that this is a letter of recommendation that the county include a line item in the three-year budget forecast to allocate $70 million for a behavioral health crisis response center that's commensurate with the needs of our client population. It's uh, appropriate at this time as we are in a budget review period. Um, the crisis response center would provide a continuum of services um, that includes a walk-in clinic, 23-hour secure observation, and residential crisis services for both adults and children. Uh, there'd be a state-of-art psychiatric specialty ER, including the ca capacity for rapid police drop-off. We do not currently have a facility um, that is a crisis response center in Santa Cruz County. Unfortunately, we have to use our jail, which houses about 100 uh, inmates that are in need of mental health crisis services. Um, we are also currently launching crisis response teams, which will need this type of a crisis response center. Um, the letter also includes architectural drawings for your reference. So again, thank you for considering our recommendation that the county include a three-year budget forecast item for $70 million for a behavioral health crisis response center. Thank you for your service and your support. Thank you so much. Tim, your microphone's now available. Thank you so much, Board of Supervisors, for letting me speak today. My name is Tim Delaney, and I live up on the summit. I am highly supportive of all the folks that have spoken before you regarding uh, the situation with AT&T and landlines. I look at things from a national security perspective, okay? Whether it's cell, landline, SAT, or radio, you need all of these things in your community, okay? And I want to remind everyone on the other side of the world, there are a whole bunch of wars, okay? And extreme sex violence being meted out on these people, okay? Whether it be Ukraine, Syria, Israel, or Darfur. So that stuff may come our way. And uh, so looking at Santa Cruz County here, these corporations here, they're playing games with you, all of you and uh, doing things that are detrimental to your communication abilities, that's unacceptable, okay? And mind you all, Elon Musk, <laughs> he's like a Benedict Arnold out there. It's like, what's up? Whose side are you on? So you probably all heard about Taiwan and him being not very supportive of our U.S. military in Taiwan with his Starlink system and so on. As far as I'm concerned, the federal government ought to just yank the whole thing from him and take it over, okay? So that's uh, that angle on measure one, okay? That's junk. Don't vote for that. Measure K, that's kind of cool, okay? All bucks need to come to Santa Cruz County. Don't feel bad about looting the tourists who are Silicon Valley. I'm okay with paying a little extra money at the grocery store. If I know money's coming to Santa Cruz County and that helps all of you, that's awesome, okay? So those are my comments for you all. Thank you so much, and you have a fine day. Thank you very much. Justin, your microphone is now available. 
Good morning, County Supervisors. My name is Justin White. I'm the CEO of k and Landscaping here in Watsonville. And today I'm actually reaching out in regards to the PLA that's on the agenda. We have over 130 employees that work here at k and Landscaping, and we understand PLA is at a deep level. City of Watsonville passed one a few years back, and I have spent tens of thousands of dollars with lawyers and other individuals trying to develop a way that candy landscaping can work on projects with a PLA. However, the only way we're able to work on those projects is if we join the union. So PLAs are very simple while also being very complicated. The simple part of them, which is in the staff report, and I'll just read it, you know, PLAs can adversely affect local contractor participation because of the requirement to utilize union labor and pay into union benefit trust funds. Now, if you're a union company, this is very easy. It's business as usual. If you're a non-union company, you have to go about unionizing your workforce, which is a giant decision for a small business owner. And I consider ourselves a small to medium size business. And we've invested a lot of money into training. We've looked at the unions multiple times because we want to work in the city that we're headquartered here in Watsonville. However, there is no landscape union. So there is only a laborers union. Passing a PLA would default eliminate k and Landscaping and other non-union contractors from bidding on jobs in the county. We know this because the city of Watsonville. So today I urge you to do the research, read the staff report, side with small businesses of County of Santa Cruz, and do not vote to put in a PLA. Thank you. Yeah. Eric, your microphone is now available. Good morning, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yes. Thank you. Just really quick, I wanna point out, my name is Eric Christian. I'm the executive director of the Coalition for Fair Employment and Construction. We're a statewide organization that was formed 25 years ago by union and non-union construction firms to oppose discriminatory PLAs. Every union worker who has spoken today, their contractors can already bid on every project that go on to the county. So nothing changes for them. Under a PLA, all the non-union construction firms and workers and apprentices are implicitly and explicitly ex excluded from being able to work under your projects. What problems exist that require this divisive and discriminatory PLA? The workforce in California just released by the Bureau of Labor Statistics is 86% union free. Why would you seek to force those non-union workers to pay into union pension plans, which you do under a PLA, that you'll never invest in? This is wage theft. Is the board supportive of wage theft? Have you surveyed local contractors to find out what their views are on PLAs and whether you'll lose them as a bidder or not? Have you researched how poorly the city of Santa Barbara's PLA has gone on the one project they placed it on? City of Watsonville, the same thing. It's been a disaster for them. They're not getting the bidders that they did on non-PLA projects. They explicitly discriminate against non-union apprenticeship programs. Young men and women looking to have a future in the trades who happen to be in non-union state-approved apprenticeship programs. PLAs explicitly exclude them. Why would you consider such a thing? Do you have a provision in your PLA like the Southwestern Community College down in San Diego that says if you don't get three bidders and or it's 10% over the budget, the winning bid, you send it back out to bid without a PLA. That protects you. Why would you not have a real apples to apples comparison and have a project bid with and without a project labor agreement so you can see for yourself what they do? We're going through a record inflationary period. This will only make it worse by making it more difficult for local workers and contractors to bid. Please vote no. Thank you. Thank you very much. Katrina, your microphone is now available. Thanks, Board of Supervisors and members of the community. Hello, my name is Katrina Christensen and I work at K&D Landscaping. A local company based here in Watsonville has provided landscaping services since 1986. We employ over 130 people and the majority of our work is in Santa Cruz County. At K&D, my role is to provide support to our teams in the office and the field. We're a non-union company and we are able, not able to work on projects that have a PLA requirement um, for all labor on jobs that really need to be unionized. There is currently a PLA in Watsonville City, and unfortunately, we have been able to 
watch out of town landscape contractors come as far away as Arizona to work in a city that we grew up in as a company and are located since 1986. The advocates of the PLA will argue that companies like K&D can still work on PLA projects, but let me tell you, we have worked hard to figure out a path in Watsonville and to this day are still unable to compete on bids or projects with the PLA. I'm asking you to look at the local businesses such as K&D Landscaping, which are non-union, and ask yourself if you would want to ban companies like us from working in your county and working on your projects. To end this, I'd like to read something from the staff report that jumps out to us. PLAs could adversely affect local contractor participation because the requirement to utilize union labor and pay into union benefit trust funds for worker wages. Smaller contractors currently make up a large portion of the workforce in Santa Cruz County. These smaller contractors may not have the scale or resources to comply with the terms of the PLAs, and there's a risk that these agreements could adversely discourage those smaller local contractors from submitting bids or participating to subcontractors. PLAs can favor larger non-local contractors, undermining the county's goal to support local businesses and develop a local labor, particularly to hire requirements that are not well-defined included in the PLA. I want to add that KD has the resources and we do perform many federal and state prevailing wage projects and have a full-time compliance manager. It's not a matter of resources. It's a matter of fact that our team is non-union. And for that reason, we are not allowed to work on these PLA projects unless they join a union. I encourage you to vote no. Thank you so much. Caller 0193, your microphone is now available. Good morning, this is Angela Chestnut calling on behalf of Second Harvest Food Bank of Santa Cruz County. And I would like to express my gratitude to the entire board of supervisors and to Director Reed of the Office of Response, Recovery and Resilience for consent agenda item number 25 to approve a two year standby contract with CBOs like Second Harvest Food Bank in order to support county emergency operations during major disaster events. As we saw last winter, the multiple atmospheric river events our county is at risk from the impacts of climate change are not going to cease anytime soon. Second Harvest Food Bank was one of the first organizations with boots on the ground to assist our community by delivering fresh water, warm meals to our evacuation sites, helping to fill sandbags. And this will no doubt occur again. We'd like to really um, thank OR3 for the proactive work during these sunny blue sky times in order to engage and coordinate in preparation with CBOs like us so that we are ready for action when disaster strikes again. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Rex, your microphone is now available. Hi, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Rex Heim with Western Electrical Contractors Association, and I was also Banana Slug. WECA represents electrical contractors throughout the state of California. Developing today's and tomorrow's workforce, we educate apprentices with our state and federally approved apprenticeship program. And I'm here to speak against a discriminatory and costly project labor agreement. PLAs discriminate against our state approved apprentices, and they're told they're not welcome to work on projects, even if they uh, are residents of the county. Uh, apart from that explicit discrimination, PLAs also prohibit non-signatory contractors from using their own employees on jobs, even if they are constituents. If local hires an issue you have interest in, there are many measures of a PLA that prevent tax dollars from going back to the constituents in the county. Uh, due to that and non-signatory contractors not being able to use their own workforce, it discourages a segment of local contractors from bidding on projects at all under a PLA. And we all know that when bids go down, costs go up and taxpayer dollars don't go as far as they should. At a time when everyone's experiencing trying to stretch their dollars as far as they can, I don't believe the county is at a luxury to have a different mindset of being smart with their constituents' tax dollars. Uh, Watsonville and their PLA bid results is living proof of the disregard for being responsible with constituents and in their, in their dollars. Uh, and, and a last reminder, I do want to say that wages on public works jobs are set by the law with prevailing wage. So it all workers on public works jobs will be paying the same wages uh, and, and getting the same benefits. And for those reasons, I'm here to urge you to reject a discriminatory project labor agreement, allow access for all apprentices on your project, and for all contractors to bid, uh, and, and allow all of your uh, constituents to reap the benefits of not signing on to a project labor agreement. Thank you for your time. Thank you. 
Farrow, your microphone is now available. Thank you. Hi, um, good morning. My name is Sarah Amanoff. I'm a teacher in the San Francisco Bay Area. Please oppose AT&T's ask for relief as carry of last resort. We need our landlines to withstand fires, earthquakes. Landlines don't require power, unlike VoIP. It is not progress to rip out the highest quality network and replace with one prone to drop calls. I was just in Ukiah and was amazed at hearing all these people who had who only relied on their landline, you know, and that cellular service was greatly inferior. Also, landlines provide access and emergency and include location-specific data. VoIP does not. Closing the digital divide should be through all existing infrastructure, including DSL on copper lines and fiber optics. Santa Cruz needs to also protect from fires, and more cell towers can be a fire risk. Three fires in California have been started. Um, in part by telecommunications equipment failures, Silverado, Wolseley, and Malibu Canyon. Landlines do not carry the same health risk as cell phones, which emit RF microwave radiation, and the World Health Organization says may cause cancer and is associated with brain tumors. Furthermore, cell towers and cell phones are an unsafe substitute for landlines due to cybersecurity reasons, digital data over VoIP, and cell phones is hackable from anywhere, while transmissions over wire can only be intercepted by direct physical access. Thank you. Yeah. Lauren, your microphone is now available. Good morning. My name is Lauren Wolfer, and I am speaking today in, in favor of item 29 on consent in my role as Outreach and Advocacy Director for Cook Alliance, a nonprofit committed to legitimizing the sale of home cooked food. Our organization has actively supported permitted Miko chefs across the state, the majority of whom are women and people of color with education and resources, and we have seen the success firsthand. We have worked with counties and public health on implementation of MECO programs and have collected data and tracked progress. A two-year case study of the legal, legal MECOs in Riverside County conducted in 2021 found that there were zero food safety complaints and 98.5% code enforcement compliance. The San Diego Health Department has been closely monitoring their MECO program which began as a pilot and was recently made permanent, and has reported that thus far, there haven't been any major risk factor violations observed, no reports of foodborne illness, and no reports of community impact complaints. There are a number of individuals who are already operating illegally in the shadows on social media sites, such as Facebook and Instagram. And a formal MECO program will not only help them, but it will also protect public health by creating clear, tailored regulations and training. Our organization hopes to work with your health department and local nonprofits to provide education, outreach, resources, and support with the goal of helping to build new local businesses and cultivating the community. Thank you for the opportunity just to speak today. Thank you so much. Rabia, your microphone's now available. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you. Hello, I'm Rabia Barkins from Scotts Valley and I oppose ATT wanting to drop the landlines. The impact of public safety without landlines cannot be overstated. Rural areas are at risk, but not just rural residents. In the city of Scotts Valley, power has gone out multiple times for days at a time over the past few years and the BOIP internet phones did not work since they are dependent on modem electric outlets. PG&E service is not stable during storms, earthquakes, and fires. Just this month, my internet phone was not working for a whole day and a half during a storm. Fortunately, we have a landline. Also, cell towers did not work in the past during a storm. Our cell service was not available for days at a time, I do not want to depend on a wireless internet only for communication. In the Scott, city of Scotts Valley, I live in a senior community where many are dependent on their landline phones and have a senior neighbor with a landline for emergencies. Seniors 
anyone living alone, the disabled, as well as others, need access to a landline. By the way, anyone can become disabled at any time. Canceling and not maintaining old and new installations is unsafe for the public. A corporation should not be solely allowed to make this decision that affects the public regarding safety and health for the rest of our lives. Do not trust their excuses. I hope the Santa Cruz Board can make a right decision to protect the public in Santa Cruz County. This is not a choice, it's a necessity, especially in a county that has possible fires, earthquakes, and floods. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Caller 7780, your microphone is now available. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, this is Craig Chatterton from District 2. I would like to speak on item 8, the broadband plan. I would ask that the supervisors defer approval and ask CTC to update the plan. I submitted a letter with more information, but I'd like to go through a couple of points and concerns. I believe that the, the plan understates the unserved numbers of people in Santa Cruz County by probably a factor of two. The plan refers to the ACS census survey, but does not mention the fact that over 8% of the responses to that survey claim they are using satellite internet, internet which does not qualify as broadband. So their numbers that they cite in the report of like 4% are each probably understated by at least a factor of two. Secondly, uh, the fixed wireless uh, option that they offer in terms of infrastructure, if that were implemented along with the AT&T request to uh, remove colors, means that over a thousand residents in Santa Cruz County would not have broadband or telephone service. They'd be totally cut off of both those capabilities, which is, I think, unfair. Uh, one of the alter there is no alternative for cable. And we heard earlier today that Comcast is very interested in working with the county to expand service. But the plan that they put forward and the options they include does not include cable, despite the fact that cable covers maybe 60 to 70 percent of the county. It would be much more cost effective than fiber, which is what they were uh, mentioning in the plan. So that needs to be added. There's no mention of the AT&T colors issue or the PG outages, which both affect broadband. These are not disjoint issues. Uh, another issue is the fact that pg e is going to be rolling out uh, underground cabling. That should be incorporated with broadband rollout as well. We pay $500,000 for this plan. We really should get a robust plan that actually meets all of our future needs. And in its current state, it is not ready to do that. Thank you. Susan, your microphone is now available. My name is Susan Sims. I am a woman-owned certified small business, and I have done, and I am qualified to do public work projects, and I am non-union. I am here to say no to a PLA and would not bid a project with a PLA on it. My workers have been with me for over 15 years now. They receive competitive pay and benefits and could leave and join a union if they chose to, but they do not, as approximately 80% of all workers choose every day to work for non-union contractors. Santa Cruz County has very few union contractors because it cannot support them with continuous public work projects. All PLAs have requirements that are harmful to non-union contractors. There is a core workforce requirement in all PLAs that allow non-union contractors to only have a couple of their own workers, or as in the failed Watsonville PLA, none of their own workers. Union shops are allowed to have all their workers. This is an unfair advantage and discriminates against non-union contractors based on their not having affiliation with a union. No contractor or any business owner would bid a job without their own trained workers. A contractor's workers are what make them qualified to bid. Without their workers, their safety and successful completion of the jobs are at risk because they do not know the skills or challenges of the workers the unions are sending to them. If you remove the core workforce requirement from the PLA, the unions would no longer support it because it is the only reason they want a PLA. It is to discourage non-union contractors from bidding. 
Non-union contractors have been doing your work. They have built your city and they have been paying the pre prevailing wages and benefits that are required by law. Do not abandon your local contractors who have been doing your work successfully without a PLA. Do no harm and say no to a PLA. Thank you. Josie, your microphone is now available. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, my name is Josie Roberto and I'm the chairperson for the Substance Use Disorder Commission. And I would like to speak to the item on the consent agenda for sunsetting our commission. And I just wanted to thank the board, thank the CAO and staff for, and HSA for putting all this together. And our commission would also like to, you know, just express our gratitude for our service. And we'd also like to just offer our support, our continued support for the new commission, hopefully to be called the Behavioral Health Advisory Board in the future. And we would also like the board to consider expanding the seats. And the reason for that is, you know, I personally have spent the last three and a half years listening to all the said providers in the county and I feel like we've just started to open up and identify all the real issues this county has to providing the best services. I know there's some wonderful people on the mental health advisory board but I also feel that um, there's four of us commissioners that would also like to continue our service on this new board and we have a lot of insight and connections and knowledge that we can bring forth. So I, I hope that you can consider that in the future. I am speaking with CAO staff about that. So uh, be looking forward to talking more about that in the next coming months. I hope you all have a beautiful day and I appreciate your time and your energy um, making this all work. Take care. Thank you so much and thank you for your service. Just wanted to check real quick, just given time uh, to see how many more people, how many more speakers we have online. That is all the speakers, Chair. Perfect timing. All right, well, with that, um, we will bring it back to the board for um, action, deliberation, and comments on consent. And I'll start with, uh, well, actually, I'll see if there's anything that staff wanted to respond to in terms of the comments that were made by members of the public. No comments, Chair. Okay. With that, um, I'll go to Supervisor Friend to see if you have any comments, questions on the uh, consent agenda. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be brief um, on item 21, an appreciation for all the work of our local uh, law enforcement, fire, and other providers in regards to this, um, the release for proposal for the next-gen radio system. One of the things that we definitely learned, and I mean, here we are having a pretty significant conversation on one of these upcoming items about uh, communication challenges is one of the lessons learned from some of the natural disasters was pretty significant public safety communications challenges. And this is in response to that. This is a, will be really one of the largest investments in public safety communications that's been in this county's history. Uh, it has the full support of all the uh, local fire chiefs, police chiefs, and all the local cities. So it's a pretty significant uh, upgrade and investment that's being proposed. So I hope that we get a very robust response from providers in order to have a really quality network. But this is showing that when a disaster occurs, the county still is uh, doing reviews to ensure that we can improve upon our responses moving forward. Uh, appreciation for uh, the Parks Department on the Willbrook items, items 32 and 33. These are just closeout items, but if you haven't had an opportunity to go down and see the remarkable improvements of that park in honor of Sergeant Damon Gutzweiler, I'd recommend that you go do it. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty powerful. And the last on item 41, the, the Aptos signal project, this is um, mainly paid for by a Monterey Barrier Resources District grant, but this will uh, significantly improve not just traffic flow, but also CO2 emission issues for cars that are idling through that area. So this has been a long worked on project. So appreciation to Steve Wiesner in particular and Public Works for his help on that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Hernandez. You had no comments, Mr. Chair. Oh, I didn't hear it. Thank you, uh, Supervisor McPherson. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, a couple items uh, on the consent agenda. Um, number 25, the emergency contracts with the community based organizations. I want to thank uh, the Office of uh, Response, Recovery and Resilience for bringing these contracts to the board. I'm glad we are formalizing these relationships uh, for our response agencies uh, to provide critical services during some natural disasters that we've had. These uh, two year contracts uh, acknowledge the high value of our CBOs uh, and what they bring to the community members in difficult times and the resources they, they add to the county's efforts. Uh, during emergencies. And um, dedicating the, these funds is especially important at this time, as we just found out uh, to illustrate how important these are. Um, the county could lose, we just learned from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, uh, we could lose an additional $11 million in project room key reimbursements related to the COVID sheltering. Uh, due to a retroactive decision by the Federal Emergency Management Agency. So our budget uh, situation uh, just gets worse through no fault of our own. We had funds pledged in this instance, and it looks like we're not going to get them, uh, as well as I think it's $300 million, uh nationwide. But um, we're, we're going to try to do this with the best we can, what we can with what we have uh, come our uh, budget discussions. Uh, item number 29, the micro enterprise home kitchen uh, pilot that was uh, mentioned by one of our speakers. I really appreciate the progress on this, on establishing a well-regulated home cooking uh, program. And I wanna thank Supervisor Friend for partnering with me to bring this policy initiative forward to the county. Um, developing this pilot program uh, has been a long road, uh, but it represents uh, yet another uh, way our county is working to support a wider and uh, more diverse participation in our local economy. A person's ability to sell and serve home cooked products uh, can help to supplement income for family members. And I want to thank all of the local home cooks, including Penny Ellis from my fifth district, who have advocated for this uh, project, and also Olga Uniga uh, and, and other members of the environmental health staff who have worked to develop this program despite um, Many resource constraints that it's had. I look forward to reviewing this uh, proposed ordinance when it comes back in September. Um, on item number 30, um, the CalFresh employment training, this has also been mentioned. I want to thank all of our county departments and nonprofit partners for their uh, participation in establishing these contracts uh, for the benefit of the community members who are making strides toward uh, steady housing and employment. Uh, these contracts uh, through the CFET are not only uh, designed to reduce barriers uh, to housing and uh, homelessness, but also to improve the health and safety of uh, the community overall through a cleanup litter program on our streets and waterways. Um, I'm especially grateful uh, that we are supporting a pilot expansion in the downtown streets team uh, into downtown Boulder Creek, which lacks uh, formal street cleaning services along State Highway 9. Um, thank you for our uh, the Human Services Director, Randy Morris, and his team for working with Health Services on this and CDI to bring this arrangement to the board for consideration. And thank you to the Boulder Creek Business Association uh, for advocating to bring uh, downtown streets team in uh, to their community. It's going to be uh, well received and it's going to be a, a very big benefit in the issue of environmental protection and just to clean, cleaning up the area. Uh, along Highway 9 especially. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. A few items. First on item 16, approving funding for one full-time equivalent appraiser position in the assessor recorder's office. Uh, I know this sounds maybe a little dry, but when uh, you're, we're facing the budget challenges that we are as a county, this is an appraiser is one of the few positions that can actually help us generate revenue by uh, um, assessing um, or reviewing the uh, assessment for uh, property taxes uh, and helping to bring those up to speed after the sale of a property or the construction of new property, and then ultimately bring that revenue into the county so that we can then turn around and deliver uh, the services that everyone wants. Um, so excited to see this. I also think that we need to make a new GIS tech and another appraiser a priority in the 24-25 budget. Uh, for example, GIS techs are critical uh, in help ensuring that we process new maps, creating new APNs, uh, again, as part of this process uh, for both transfers uh, and uh, getting new construction moving ready. 
On item, 2020, uh, item 22, adopting a resolution in support of the Convention of the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, or CEDAW. Uh, I, this resolution really reaffirms our county's commitment to the UN Treaty that combats gender discrimination. And it also directs the Women's Commission to identify departmental data that can be used in tracking our progress uh, towards these goals. Our county's done a great job of making data more available uh, and transparent to, to the public and all organizations working to further these goals. And I think there's really an opportunity here to see where we need uh, disaggregated data um, that can show us uh, how we're actually uh, meeting the goals we've outlined and, and committing ourselves uh, to the CEDAW. Uh, uh, convention. I also want to just say thank you for item 25, the standby contracts with uh, community-based organizations. This will uh, definitely help us be more prepared when the next winter storms come around um, or any uh, any disaster. Ultimately, having all the organizations in our community know their roles uh, and know that there's going to be some compensation if they fulfill those roles is, is critical. And finally, on items 27 and 28, the behavioral health bridge housing, and then uh, also accepting a grant for the Children's Crisis Stabilization Center. Just really excited to see these two projects move forward, and they will be uh, really a leap forward for behavioral health in our community. But thank you to everyone working on those. That's it. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so uh, just a few comments um, on consent. Um, on item number 13, consistent with previous votes, I'm going to be registering a no vote on that item, largely due to the fact that, uh, as I've expressed previously, um, have some concerns with us eliminating the um, Human Services Commission. Um, item number 21, uh, this is a really big step, again, with the next-gen countywide radio system. I do think that when this comes back uh, to us later in the year, then maybe we consider having a presentation just so the community really understands how important it is that we're making these investments in our public safety radio systems. Um, item number 22 related to the, con the resolution in support of the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Um, I feel similar to Supervisor Koenig um, and you know anything we can do in our community to um, support the elimination of discrimination against women and all people um, is something that really aligns with the values of our community. So very supportive of that. Um, also, item number 25, just really want to appreciate the work that our CBOs do. Second Harvest Food Bank, Community Bridges, and Community Action Board have really been critical partners with the county when we've had to deal with um, times of disaster, especially within the last few years dealing with COVID, uh, the failure of the Papa Road River levee, um, and many other disasters that have hit our county. So just want to express appreciation for those groups and uh, appreciate the funding that we're going to put towards them. And then my last comment um, is on item number 27. Um, I'd like to ask that we uh, consider that the construction on that project be done under a project labor agreement. And we're going to be talking more about that later on this afternoon. But um, just so people understand, this is um, the demolition of a building to then build 34 tiny homes and it would serve as a low barrier navigation center. And the budget for that is around five million dollars in terms of construction. And you know, that's it, it really does seem like a project that we could use as an example um, for how these things can work. And if we don't want to have a PLA with that project, we can always um revisit that. But I think you know, using that as an example of how we can consider moving forward uh, would be good. So I'd I'd like to include that in the motion if it's at all possible. Um, with that, uh, those, that concludes all my comments. And so I'll turn it back to the board to see if there's a motion on the consent agenda. I'll make a motion to move consent agenda. And I do have a, a quick uh, comment. Uh, I just wanted to thank the parks, uh, Re Rebecca and uh, Stony Brooks, uh, local veteran here, uh, to ensuring that vets have access to and services as well to the Veterans Hall. So thank you. So a motion by Supervisor Hernandez. Do we have a second? Chair, if I, just a just a comment. I'm mean, sympathetic to the, your your thoughts on item 27, but uh, given that this is particularly for uh, the non-infrastructure program elements, um, I think maybe it makes more sense if we um, c consider something uh, to your the effect of your suggestions when we actually discuss item uh, nine. Okay, I'm not all of that. So 
so if, what was the motion? This so the consent the, was moved by Supervisor Hernandez, and then we need a second on the, the consent. Uh, okay, I'll second. Okay, so we have a motion by Supervisor Hernandez, seconded by Supervisor Koenig to move the consent agenda. Um, I'd like to ask the clerk to please call roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. Um, okay, with that, um, we're going to be moving on to our regular agenda. And the first item on our regular agenda today is consider a presentation on AT&T's position regarding its obligation as a current care of last resort for Santa Cruz County and its application for COLA relief as outlined in the mem memorandum of Chair Cummings. And so with that, I'd like to invite up the representatives from uh, AT&T who are joining us today. And I believe that you can, yeah, you can sit. Um, yeah, on the other side of the podium. And before we begin, I'd just like to make a, a couple um, quick introductory comments. Um, when I was uh, first came on the board last year, my office began really reaching out to um, residents to understand what the communication issues were and tried really hard to get in touch with representatives from the different telecommunication companies. Um, it took us a while, it took us about nine months, but we were finally able to get in touch with AT&T, um, who I will say uh, was really helpful with us being able to reinstall uh, landline service up in White House Canyon, which people had lost after the fires. Um, and then we had a lot of, we continue to have discussions around the various technologies that AT&T provided, um, including some of their um, uh, their small cell tower facilities, among other things. Um, but one thing that we had discussed at that time also was landline service. And to our knowledge at that point was that AT&T did not provide uh, landline service. Uh, and when we heard about the COLA relief, which I want to thank members of the public who brought that to our attention as well, um, it became apparent that um, as, the COLA, as the COLA provider, at and is required to provide uh, residents who want some form of landline with a landline. Um, they're responsible for maintaining quality of service um, and providing maintenance in a timely manner and ensuring that the, that the uh, service is affordable. And so after hearing that um, and after the feedback that we all received, I thought it was fitting that we at least have an opportunity to hear more from at and and so that we can get some clarity around um, what the responsibilities are um, in terms of providing provision of these services, um, what options are available to people, and what the impacts will be if they remove themselves from being the carrier of last resort. And so with that, I will turn it over to uh, at and staff or representatives so they can provide us with the presentation today. Good morning, President Cummings and members of the board. My name is Teddy Verjeas, and I am the Vice President of External Affairs for AT&T California. I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk with you today about this important topic, the carrier of last resort or a Kohler application that's pending before the PUC. We're here today to present our perspective, but we're, we're really here today to address your questions and hear from members of the community and I want to, uh, before I jump into these comments, I, I wanna make sure that the, um, the community understands we're doing some of these meetings. We have a community meeting tomorrow in Felton so we can get out and answer questions that if people weren't here or weren't able to join us today. Um, and we also have one coming up in Watsonville as well. So um, we're happy to, uh, come and meet and answer any questions about this application and uh, appreciate the opportunity again to be here today. I want to um, also thank the, the, the members who are here from Bonnie Dune and from Davenport. Betty and I, uh, when we lost our cell antenna at the cement factory in Bonnie Dune um, in Davenport, we, we, we spent a lot of time in the area and, and I, know that the wireless coverage is not very good there. 
Um, in fact, I didn't have a lot of coverage down the coast and it wasn't until I could get on the Wi-Fi at the restaurant most times when we went down there that we we had coverage at all. And so we understand um, how difficult communications are in certain regions of our territory. And throughout these public participation hearings, I've been at four so far that the PUC has hosted. There's two days of them, but four meetings, uh, two o'clock and six o'clock. And I've heard a lot of fear and a lot of um, anger about what AT&T is doing or what it's not doing. And really appreciate, again, the time to be here today to clear up the misconceptions that I think the notices that were sent out um, letting people know that there were public participation hearings. It was not our uh, it was not our preference. It was not the language that we had hoped that we could be sending out to our customers. Uh, but that was the language that was settled on. Um, and so those messages went out. And obviously, ever since then, they have created a lot of confusion about what's going on with this application. So I'll go ahead and jump into that today. Um, and, um, again, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions, um, and, um, either after or during, if there's something that comes up. So the California Public Utilities Commission designated Pacific Bell, which is now AT&T, as the carrier of last resort nearly 30 years ago. With this designation comes the obligation to provide basic telephone service to anybody in our territory who wants it. And at this time, at the time, Pacific Bell was the only provider installing copper-based landline phone service within our territory, so it made sense back then. And we fast forward almost 30 years, there are over, uh, there, there's dozens, over 100 telecommunications companies providing services in the state of California. And we know that that there are a lot of people who have left this network over the years. We used to have um, we used to have between 12 and 15 million customers on the network. And today, our residential portion is about 490,000 customers statewide in our service territory. And because this is a regulated utility, there are the, the cost, the cost that customers pay is uh, the way that it's, the way that it's calculated is it's a tariff product. And so if I live in a more rural city, it's easier and cheaper for AT&T to deploy a line. But if I live in a rural part of California and I am 30 miles from the closest telephone pole, somebody has to pay for that line. And so we all pay into a, a fund that helps to subsidize the cost to bring that service out to somebody who lives very far away. So with millions of people paying into that fund, there are, um, the rates are, are pretty steady. But as that number drops, the cost to bring that service out is borne by those people who are left on the network. So those 490,000 people are gonna bear the cost to, to, to bring those um, services out to more rural communities. And that that remains that that portion of that regulated service. But we know that customers are 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 voting with their feet. They're leaving AT&T basic service behind overwhelmingly in favor of advanced technologies like fiber and wireless and where they're available. And I get it when it's not available or it's not, you know, in Bonnie Dune or it's not in Davenport. There's no other option than your landline. AT&T's Kohler application relief doesn't pertain to that. This is not a one and done approval. It is a very targeted approach. So the CPUC will determine whether or not there are alternatives available to members in certain communities within our service territory and will determine if they should allow COLA relief in that region or not. And you've heard today, there is no other alternative that cellular service is not reliable and you cannot rely on it in emergencies and fires. Um, so those landlines aren't going away and 
we're likely not going to get COLA relief in those areas. We won't get COLA relief in those areas where there are all no where there are no alternatives. And so if I could go back <laughs> before those notices went out and I could put that in the letter, I absolutely would do that to help. I would do a few other things uh, um, to help um, clarify what what it is and what how this proceeding works. So if anybody is in a region where there are no alternatives available, and I will make a comment that the maps that we have submitted for have been taken off of the CPUC website. It is not at and data. We do not have access to competitors' data. So we had to rely on the CPUC website maps. So those maps are what we have based this on. In April, this proceeding will, will move forward and there will be evidentiary proceedings that open at the PUC. And all of these questions about whether or not the maps are accurate or whether or not there's viable alternatives, all of that is going to come out in that proceeding. And so, so the commission will take our opposition, uh, they will take comments from the community, they will take um, all of the input that they have received and they will review it, they will research it and they will render a decision. So this is a multi-year process. This is not going to happen tomorrow. Nobody's having their landline shut down. We are not turning off service. There's a lot of, um, there is a lot of um, information out there. And I, I, I will share with you that in Santa Cruz County, I know this is a question that some of you have asked. We have about 12,000 copper landlines in Santa Cruz County. And when I listen to, when I, I've been in Ukiah, I've been in Clovis, I, I've been at many community meetings and I've talked to many members of the public. I also rolled out fiber, AT&T fiber in Comchi last week, which was super exciting. Um, and I know that the communities that are relying on landline deserve better. And I know that you know that. And I know that the state of California knows that because they are dedicating over $8 billion to helping to bridge the digital divide. But just as the Comcast woman said this morning, it takes everybody. It's going to be us, Cruise.io, Comcast. It's every provider in this state to work in collaboration with the county to figure out how we bridge the digital divide. Because our copper network is going away someday. It's absolutely going away. There's 7% of our customer population left on that network. And to maintain that network across the state of California, for every dollar we put in a copper network, we are not investing in advanced technologies of the future. You're talking about E911 services, right? Those aren't running over copper anymore. Those are running over fiber. All of our advanced technologies, our first responders, our first net network, those are running over advanced services. They're not running over copper. Copper is not what we're putting in. The state of California, over $8 billion to bring fiber to communities or wireless, depending on what makes sense. So it's a hybrid. But it's working in collaboration with all of the carriers, with communities, identifying where those needs are so that we can make sure that people are not left with only copper at the end of the day. They deserve better than that. So I'm going to, I'm going to leave you, you know, sort of with this and I, and I'm, I'm happy to take your questions. Um, we know that again, this is a, this is a very long drawn out process and it will take um, months, years for it to for it to work its way out. The CPUC is not the only regulatory agency that will have input into how this works. There's also the FCC. And so we have to make sure that whatever product, whatever service our customers end up with at the end of the day is at least as good as copper. 
And so that whole process is, again, going to be worked out at the FCC. But I want to I wanna leave you with this if I can. AT&T, it is our business to connect people. These are our customers that we are hearing from. And again, we spent, we spent a, several months just hearing what you heard today. And we have to do better. We absolutely have to do better. And we have great opportunity with all of this federal funding to do better. We value our customers and we greatly appreciate their loyalty and we will leave no one behind in this transition. They are our customers. And you know, as I, as I began moments ago, rules adopted 30 years ago that require AT&T to offer services throughout our service territory for a technology that has come to the end of its life cycle is not, is not good enough anymore. So we're going to be working in a prudent, measured, and thoughtful, very transparent way to ensure that our customers have, have access to the most advanced, reliable technologies available. They deserve it. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, I guess at this point in time, I'll open up to the board to see if there's any members of the board that have questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for being here. Um, I think that, excuse the pun, that uh, you acknowledge that the communication has been less than perfect. And uh, so I, uh, I'm glad you're looking forward. And I wanna begin by thanking all of our community members who were here today and contact the county uh, and the CPUC to express their thoughts. And also to remind everybody that uh, I'm looking forward to a community meeting tomorrow in Felton yes. at the Felton Community Center at uh, 5.30 on Highway 9. So please, if you weren't here today, please be here, uh, be there tomorrow. Um, as I mentioned, the comments supporting our board action two weeks ago uh, to oppose the AT&T's application uh, and reliable foreign service, uh, specifically the copper lines, uh, it really represents, as you've said, a life-saving tool for our residents. And we've had seven national disasters, as you've heard about, seven years, which really can complicates things for especially people in the, mount, the uh, mountain areas. <clears throat> and I can understand the the challenges that at and &E has uh, with and other telecom companies as well. But we we really uh, sitting here on the board, uh, we can't make our rural residents pay the price for this innovation when the alternatives to landlines uh, have not yet proven to be resilient during these major events that we have experienced. Um, there's just a lack of confidence that this will be done. I mean, I don't know what the roadmap is personally. Exactly. You've explained it. This is a, a two or three year process, I think, uh, as I've heard. But um, uh, I, I just, I'm not, I don't feel self-assured for the residents in my fifth district, especially the San Lorenzo Valley, that uh, they're gonna have communication and, uh, three years from now. Uh, the plan of attack has not been really specified to, to really satisfy me at this point. And I know you're getting there and there's a lot of uh, differences uh, and, and issues that you have to face. But one, one question, I, you explained somewhat the, uh, you know, how this map was drawn up and it needs to be redrawn, I believe, about who uh, your proposed service mats uh, were developed. And there's amount of concern, there's a, a great amount of concern in the community uh, that they don't accurately, accurately represent the proposed coverage because right here, this is Bonnie Dune in the area and, and the North Coast, but it seems like uh, it's not a crisis situation in the San Rosa Valley, but I don't believe that. Right, right. And so I, I don't know how these maps, <clears throat> and is a new one going to be drawn and what's, or how's that process going to go? Yeah, so so we've heard uh, in other in other forums that, you know, I, I show blue on the map, but I have no coverage on, you know, Jones and Flint Road, right? Like at the cross section, like I, I don't have any coverage there. Or as I'm driving down 128, you show coverage, it's blue, but it, it's actually not, I don't have coverage. So all of that is going to be worked out, but I, but I, I want to make sure that I, that I touch on, you, you said, you know, whether or not there's going to be new service in three years. I want to reiterate that if there is no alternative provider, 
if it's purple or if throughout these evidentiary proceedings, it shows that maybe the purple needs to be drawn down more, right? Or we need to alter those. Right now, this is just off of the CPUC website. This is the data that was taken off the CPUC website. It is the only competitive data that we have access to. And so we use that, but throughout this proceeding, they will determine whether or not the blue accurately reflects the coverage or the providers that are available. So that gets all worked out through the next few months during the proceeding. We're not going to be doing anything to anybody's landlines in the regions that have no alternatives. So we're not shutting anybody's line off. We're not taking anybody's landline away. If there are no alternative providers from, from if we can't provide it or a competitor of ours cannot provide it, then everybody's, everything is status quo for that region. Okay. Uh, thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to um, ask a couple additional questions, express some thoughts, and I appreciate both of you, actually a whole group of you for coming and taking the time to be here and all the residents that have already spoken. Um, you had mentioned that this constitutes 7% of the customer base. I think it constitutes 100% of their feeling of a lifeline service. And it seems as though the numbers thrown around to show a diminishing return. But if you're a customer and you're talking about you need to do better and people aren't being heard, I think what they're, what they're hearing is it's a technology that doesn't make us any money anymore. And therefore, we're not going to invest in it. And therefore, their needs aren't as important as the higher grossing needs. And by the way, this is coming from, I would submit, probably a member of the Board of Supervisors has been the most vocal on improving broadband access, improving modern techno technological opportunities in the community. But I think that there are two truths that should be recognized. One, that a technology can be uh, becoming obsolete and that we don't have a viable alternative yet to replace mm -hmm. that technology. And that would be helpful to hear AT&T proactively say that. Right. Right. I mean, I hear the first part with the numbers and the costs and that people deserve better, but they're not being presented with better, right? I mean, I think people would feel a lot more confident if they saw you investing in technologies that would ensure that they were already back. I mean, this to me, this application should come forward when there is a viable alternative, not before there's a viable alternative, right? Otherwise, otherwise what you're saying, and this is the, tr the, the difficult, and, I mean, it's like when the government says, just trust us. I mean, I mean, right, you're in the same boat here. That you're not, right? I mean, you, you can't, it, it isn't just an understanding, there needs to be an action, right? I mean, I, I believe you understand and are hearing these people. And I've worked with Betty on a lot of things. I really, I mean, she's enormously empathetic and very responsive. Mm -hmm. But there's a difference between understanding and action. And we haven't seen the action part. I think the action should proceed what you're doing. And I think that that's why we had to, as a board, express a finite position because you're expressing a finite position. There wasn't a room for a level of compromise or discussion that shouldn't, we shouldn't be in the, they shouldn't be in this community, this situation. None of us should be in this situation. Right. You put us in this situation. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is your action. This isn't us driving this action. Um, I mean, you'd said, this is a quote. All of this is going to get worked out. <laughs> um, On whether there's an alternative provider. I, I understand during the evidentiary part. Right. But what does that mean? I mean, when you've got somebody who views it, you had residents 
You have an individual sitting right in front of me here who said that she wouldn't be alive but for having this service during the fires. That's that threshold, yeah, right, is higher than all of this is going to be worked out. So that's where I think that the timing of this is problematic, right, for uh, what's coming forward. I recognize that this was supposed to be a question to you, and this has been more of a statement, and I apologize about that. Um, I do have a question, though, in regards to this. If it isn't really making money, and it's a dying technology, and it is determined that a lot of these areas, there's no viable alternative, what's AT&T's plan to at least invest in the maintenance and upgrade of that service? Because you're basically telling me right? That there's no, I mean, you're literally asking the CPUC to, get, to to say you don't have to do this anymore. So there clearly isn't an ethos within the company to want to invest in the service. So for those that have no other viable alternative in that intervening time, what is your, not just commitment, but what is your actual action that you'll take to ensure that those lines are maintained, upgraded, et cetera, until the viable alternative is presented? So we remain the carrier of last resort in that situation. So we have service quality standards that are put forth by the PUC that we have to deliver on every year. So there, there, there is that, um, that sort of, you know, other side of the coin, if you would. So along with that carry of last resort obligation that we would maintain in areas where there are all no alternatives. And, you know, if that's the case in, in Davenport and that's the case in Bonnie Dune and Ben Lohman, like, they're going to keep those landlines until and unless there is a provider that comes in at some point. I don't know when that day is. It might be the state of California. It might be somebody who receives federal funding. It might be us. It might be another provider. But until and unless that day happens, we remain the carrier of last resort and we have an obligation to maintain and service those lines. Okay. I'll, I'll leave with this that the regulatory authorities that are doing the evidentiary hearing, and particularly the CPC, but in some respects, more importantly, the SCCs, for the last 25 years have worked to remove local control and local voice from the decision process functionally. I mean, the, the regulatory authorities, be it with a PG&E or be it with, you know, even something that I'm completely for, like broadband deployment, these are no longer within local control. And I think one of part of what you're hearing, I know that there would be disagreement. I mean, you can, you, can, you, can, you can disagree with me on that because I hear from Betty all the time, takes forever in the permitting process. But I mean, let me tell you something though. More and more local control has been removed from permitting processes in the last 30 years than has been given to local governments. Okay. I think we can agree on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I didn't ask for that. You asked for that. Meaning... It's the carriers, it's the ISPs that have success, it's those that are regulated that have successfully worked with the regulators, the CPC and the FCC at different times to take away local control. So I, what I would like to point out is I think the reason that you had a room full of folks is because I don't think that they feel that that voice mm. is going to be heard at a regulatory side. And they know that they can still run into me at the grocery store and say what they want to say. But we really don't have much capability in this other than amplifying their voice. It still goes in. There's still another decision-making authority that I think people are really nervous about. And as part of your consideration in your community outreach, which again, probably should have happened before the letter went out, right? Uh, before the decision was made. Uh, that's when people trust you when you say it'll get worked out or transparency was another word you use. That, that's a word that's important before you, you submit the action, not, not after, right? Understood. And there isn't a lot of faith in the regulatory agencies to amplify that. I think it's something just to recognize. I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, no, I understand your point. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Uh, Supervisor Hernandez or Koenig, have you all had a chance to comment? Uh, yes. You know, I, I live in the area where the map is blue and I still get emails from constituents, so I just kind of want to echo some of their concerns, right? Uh, a lot of them say that the landline's really their only option, even though they're on Casserly, Green Valley, Hazel Dell, and adjacent to uh, Zach Friend's district. And so 
I want to make sure that we do address, you know, those concerns. And we do have, you know, the community meetings are happening and I want to make sure we have them before the 24th of March. That, um, that we can do that and answer some of their, you know, questions that they might have there. But yeah, I think that's pretty much, you know, even though it's in the blue, we're, if there is no, um, one of the questions I got is that if there's no access to anything else but landlines, will they also still be part of the, part? they'll still get landline service? If there's no other option for them. No, no other option. Yeah. We remain the carrier of last resort with service quality requirements attached to that. It's not just the red zone in the map that gets that. It's that also is, people in the blue zone. That is correct. Okay. So this this application before the PUC is for our entire service territory. Okay. And there are many areas in our service territory. I live in San Francisco. I know that there's nine other providers that I can get my landline from. Um, or my mom can. I don't have a landline. But... Um, and so it's a very different conversation than this conversation that we're having today. And we recognize that. And so does the PUC. And so this is a very targeted approach. And it's not the application or not. The CPUC will have the opportunity to, to adjust where they believe Kohler is still needed and where it's where we have met our, our you know, the the obligation to, or we have, we have shown that there is, amp, you know, alternatives that are available. So that is the standard. And if we can't meet that, or if they determine amongst themselves, um, then we're not going to be able to be relieved of our carrier obligations in that area of our service territory. Thank you. Supervisor Koenig. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll start by echoing the primary concern I've heard, which is that the blue areas are not really blue. Yeah. Right. Just because you can sell service in an area doesn't mean that people can actually access it. And as, as was mentioned, even in the heart of the urban area, uh, in Pleasure Point, you know, people are still walking to their windows or outside in order to, to get AT&T service to, to work. So I, I am concerned about how the dependability and uptime are measured when providing these services. Um, but I want to go back to something you mentioned about costs going up. I think if I were noted correctly, there used to be 10 million landline customers and it's down to 490,000 or so. I'm For residential. Residential, sure. I'm curious, I mean... How, how much is it continuing to decline? I mean, I can understand how, you know, with the generational shift, people growing up on cell phones, being more used to using their cell phone, that, and they do have service. Obviously, yeah, you, they're going to stop being landline customers. I'll be, I'll be honest, I don't have a landline at my home. My parents very much depend on theirs. Right. Um, but are we still seeing that change right. happening, right? Or... Are we pretty much steady now around the 490,000 customers? So we we absolutely are seeing the decline. The numbers that we submitted to the PUC, I believe, were on December 22. As of December 22, the new numbers, the around 490,000 for residential customers, are the uh, 2023. I don't know the exact number, um, but it's a, but it's. I want to say between business and residential, we 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 lost a couple hundred thousand customers between December 2022 and 2023. So those were the business combined with residential. And then there's a proportionate share that gets divided amongst the two. Mm -hmm. So we we know that um it's it's continuing to decline. Um, but I also recognize that we're down to the numbers that likely don't have. A lot of alternatives. Like again, my mom's in that four hundred ninety thousand. She got, you know, she has other alternatives. If she wants to keep her landline, she may not. There's also fax machines in that. There's also elevators in that, right? So, so that number continues to decline year over year at a at a pretty substantial clip. And so, again, you know, it's not just about us not wanting to invest in this network. It's about making sure that when it, you know, it's like analog television. Nobody wanted to have to go out and buy these expensive flat screen TVs, but 
digital television was coming. And I don't mean to suggest that one is a lifeline and one is a, you know, an, an entertainment option, but but the point is technology does come to an end of its life cycle. And I think we have to be prudent and thoughtful about how we prepare for that transition, right? And um that's that's what that's what we're we're aiming for. Um, is how do we do that? We have received COLA relief in our 20 other states. We've already received COLA relief. We've left no one behind. We've turned off nobody's service. And so it is a long process. And it it doesn't it doesn't start the day we get the approval from the PUC. We still have 490,000 customers that we need to make sure transition to advanced services. Again, whether it's from us or a different competitor, but we need to make sure that there's no drop for those customers because everybody needs communications, everybody. And especially if you're in a rural area where you're prone to fire, floods, earthquakes, it's essential. And we understand that. Glad to hear your commitment to that. Um, do you have, you, you mentioned the 20 other states where color relief has already happened. And of course that's in cases where there are alternatives to customers. And I hear what you're saying is that as the um, total number of, of subscribers to landline services declines, then the costs have to go up because it's shared over a smaller pool of people. Uh, can you tell me any about anything about some of these the other companies that have offered landline service as an alternative in some of these other 20 states? I mean, uh, my concern would be that people will have an alternative, but that the price would go up, it would make a pretty substantial jump even further because now, as has been said, you guys have benefited from uh, really having um, protected service for decades. And I mean, I can't imagine that a new company coming in is going to have that same leg up. Um, and so it would seem to me that prices would probably make another substantial jump uh, when someone transitioned to a different provider, even if they could technically access the service, um, you know, it might be prohibitively expensive. Do you have any data around? Yeah. So I, I think, um, you know, competition is pretty powerful, right? So many, many areas uh, in our service territory where there is a competitor, for example, Comcast, you can get a, a landline cheaper over their cable service than you can over our copper wires, our, our copper wire service. So it's cheaper on that today. Our, our um, To get telephone over our um, fiber service is cheaper than it is to have a landline service today. It's a regulated product and those, it's a tariff product. So those um, rates are determined by the PUC. So there are many other competitors who are offering for any, you know, anyone who still wants to have a landline, whether it's over VoIP, whether it's over copper, um, instead of the copper line from AT&T. And the actual the cost of that service is regulated by the PUC as well? Ours is, but not our competitors. Right. Right. That's my concern. Um, all right. Well, I mean, I, I would echo Supervisor Friend's sentiment that if you are committed to transitioning to newer, more effective technologies, let's see them. Thank you, so so we're we we have a very large customer base on fiber in Santa Cruz County already. Right, right. Um, but we just want to make sure that they work in Bonnie Dune as a wall absolutely. of fire when the power is out and a wall of fire. Is absolutely, I agree. So our our alternative product um, that is being developed is uh, we'll have to we'll have to go through regulatory review, and it will be as uh, the criteria, so E911 identification, backup batteries, um, 72 hours of backup battery, uh, which is our requirement today under Kohler. 
it's our it's our requirement of the FCC under our Kohler application today, or our Kohler designation today. So just so you know, I had some constituents that were without power for 40 days last winter. So uh, it's a it's a bigger challenge than 72 hours. But well, thank you. That that becomes a PG&E issue or an sure. electric issue as well. Those are all my questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, well, before we open up to the public, I do have a few questions and comments um, because I think one of the big reasons why I really wanted to have this today is just to um, also highlight that there's been a lot of trust that's been lost between the community members and AT and T, and and I will even say that you know again since I when I first was able to con contact and connect with AT and T, and one of the first questions I asked was, well, you know, if somebody wants a new landline, can they get one? And the answer that I received was, unless you lost your line in a disaster, you cannot get a new landline. And then we come to find out now that that's not the case. And so I guess my question that I want to understand some clarity on is, if someone in Bonnie Dune today wanted to get some form of landline, given the color responsibility of AT&T, can they get one and what could they get? So our color obligation is alive and well today. And anybody who wants a phone in our service territory can have a phone in our service territory. I'm I'm not sure what, like I wasn't part of those conversations. I didn't speak to the person who was saying I can't get a phone, but I'm happy to take those if you get any of those. Um, but today you can get a landline phone, copper wire in our service territory as part of our Kohler designation. Thank you for the clarification on that. Um, and then I guess, you know, another concern that's been raised by folks is should AT&T kind of, you know, move away from the infrastructure that they currently have in place, what's going to be the plan for them to kind of clean up old infrastructure? Because we have seen corporations for long periods of time, you know, they no longer are using their infrastructure, they just leave it behind. And then it's just, you know, either left to the residents clean up with local jurisdictions or it's challenging to get them to actually follow through on the cleanup. And so for the, you know, for the many, many miles of lines that you all have, I mean, what what will be the approach to having to, to you know, remove this infrastructure from our communities? Right. So just to just to clarify, as as our customers move away from the copper network, so to answer your question, uh, between December of 22 and December of 23, uh, we had a decline of 240,000 landline customers. So um, there are many services that are going to continue to ride our, our VoIP services, our voice and over internet protocol. So we we have a lot of services that still do run over that copper network. Um, so we are going to, you know, again, this is going to take years and years and years. It took 145 years to build this network. It's going to take a long time to transition people from it onto, onto advanced services. So um, where we are no, you know, much of that network's backhaul and that backbone will stay in place. Um, but the copper lines, the two wire, two pair copper line out to out to people's homes and the technology, um, we can, you know, I I don't I don't know that uh we remove that. Uh it, I think it would depend on what services people have and our technicians um, as they come to advance new services. Some still will ride over that copper, some may not. Thanks. And then I guess as it gets back to the, you know, if anyone wants a landline, they can get a landline. Who's the best person? And how can we put these people in contact with someone who will actually follow through? Because what I was hearing from folks in my district is that people would request and call and request landlines, or even if it's, you know, maintenance issues, they get put on hold or they get told by whoever the person is on that other line that we don't do that anymore. And so I'm just wondering, how can we make sure that if people want a landline, like they can actually get it? 
And if they need maintenance, the people are going to come out and, and maintain uh, the service because that's, I mean, it's just the reality that we sit in, um, you know, as representatives of, of this county is that um, when we're hearing from folks, um, you know, oftentimes it's, it's hard for us to know where to go, where to send them because they're already going through the standard uh, protocols for trying to to reach, you know, service providers at at and and they struggle with that. And so, you know, I think, what I'm looking for here is like, how can we build better confidence with the people who are in our community and the reliability of AT&T as a service provider? Um, hi, this is Betty Saxon. Um, Supervisor Cummings or any of the others, if you have constituents that are calling you or saying they cannot get a service, then I am still here. I will assist them in getting to the right department and ensuring that, that they will get their service connected. Um, before I turn this back over to you, I want to thank you, Supervisor McPherson, for helping me get the community meeting set up in Fulton, I mean, Felton. Okay. And um, I'm also working with Supervisor Hernandez's office. But what I'd also like to do, especially listening today, is to open it up to the other districts that if you believe that you need a community meeting on Kohler, so that your constituents better understand this process, then I'm here for you. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. That's very much appreciated. Okay, um, I have. I also share some of the same concerns brought up by my colleagues, but I, I feel like in the interest of time, I want to open up to the public. I will note that if you already spoke on this item, you cannot speak again, um, and just. Since I can't really see how many people are in the room, uh, maybe a show of hands of how many folks are in the room who want to speak on this item. If somebody from the board can yeah. maybe know. Maybe about 10, Chair. Okay. Well, then we will uh, move forward with uh, two minutes for comment, and uh, and we'll go ahead and start that now. Yeah, hello, my name is James Ewing Whitman. Thank you, representatives of AT&T. You know, I lived in the rural areas in Santa Cruz from 1995 to 2013. Over half that time where I lived, I didn't get cell phone service, but I did get a cell phone in 1998. And although I still don't have the vibrating from where I held my phone, maybe for a couple years, you know, there's so many things that aren't being discussed and I can't thank you guys enough for all the one-liners you gave me you guys are really quite practiced so um the safety concerns aren't really being addressed but probably what's more important to reach out to the community probably the funnest thing that was established when i was in the community was our once a month soup group where people on the road that i lived on and that was oak ridge road we all met and got together so all the concerns about if there is a disaster, and I expect this to be a monumental year um, of natural disasters, um, people should get together and they should talk to each other. You know, uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm trying to be nice here. You guys really gave me a lot of good information to make bad jokes. But, um, you know, trusting the government and the government agencies how did that work out for the Native Americans when uh, they gave them smallpox blankets? The safety concerns, you know, as far as what's going on with wireless, the FCC in 1952 established a guidelines that was based on thermal heat based on 10 million, and that's a distance per centimeter squared. When in reality, a reading of six affects bacteria, and we're 70% bacteria. The reason why I have 316 playlists on youtube under james ewing all titled leo and youth is the only people being thrown under the bus more than law enforcement or teachers and youth thank you thank you and again i would just like to reiterate if you spoke earlier this morning on this item um we're asking that you not speak again a second time we want to be mindful that we want to give everybody a chance to speak and so if you've already spoken to us on this item please um we appreciate your comments they're noted, um, but we'd like to give other people the chance to speak. Hello, uh, my name is Colin Hannon. I'm on the board of the Davenport North Coast Association, which represents that area. Um, I've got to say that that presentation did not make anything clearer or allay my concerns. 
Um, I have a landline phone. Many of my neighbors do not. When the fire happened in 2020, I was the one who could communicate with everyone for a long time. The sky turned orange. We didn't know what was going on. I sent my family away to my parents' house many miles away. I got a call on my landline phone in the night. And it said to leave. So I went and told everybody. And we left. Um, what I haven't heard today is what about when the power is out? You say, um, we will get service if there unless or you won't drop us unless there's alternatives. But none of the alternatives work when there's no power. And everybody keeps skirting around that. And we don't really say. But if we have power for 72 hours and we have service for that length of time, that doesn't work. We, our cell phones work for 72 hours until the batteries go out when the power goes out. This was out for seven days. We didn't have service at home during that time. Luckily, it wasn't, it, there was no life threatening events, although we did have to call 911 because there was a power line down um, and we used our landline phone. So, my question for you is what is the all, like, if, what is the, the clarity on that, on if the alternatives, if there's no power? So are you still obligated to provide us landline service if there's alternatives that don't work when the power's not on? That's my question. We'll, we'll make note of that question and we'll see if we can get an answer for you. Thank you. Hello and thank you. Um, my name is Tamara O'Kelly. I live in downtown Boulder Creek. I'm the vice president of the Boulder Creek Business Association. Um, I have spent my entire life living in the mountains. I've always relied on a landline um, for emergencies. Sometimes I've been the only landline in the neighborhood and everybody would run to my house to use the phone whenever the power would go out. Um, so I have a story for you. I had a landline up until this past decade. Um, I live in a historic neighborhood, one block out of downtown Boulder Creek. Years back, they had undergrounded uh, the lines in our neighborhood to preserve the aesthetics. Um, I purchased the house. I have a landline, I use DSL. I start having disruptions on the line. So I call AT&T for service and AT&T tells me, oh, well, you have to prove to us that the issue isn't within your own walls, within your own wiring system. So in order to get my service fixed, I had to rewire my entire house, which I did. Then I go back to AT&T and I say, I still have disruption of service. And they basically told me that they would not service the lines. They weren't going to fix it. And I said, well, I've proven to you that it's not on my side. So the agreement was, is that you have to maintain your side in order for me to have consistent service with that disruption. They refused. I called over and over again. There was still a refusal. So how many of us dropped our landlines? because AT&T refused service. I'm just wondering, there's been a serious decline in how many people have landlines, how many people like myself couldn't afford to have both alternatives and had to cut their phone off, which I did, which I regret at this point. And I want my landline back because half the time my phone doesn't work. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much. My name is Rick McLeod. I live in Aptos. Can you hear me all right? I sure. appreciate you coming out. I think you must be in a terribly tough position, but I do appreciate your effort. I want to say first, there's no cell service at our house. Two, radiation. Uh, uh, you know, we won't resolve that debate today, but my housemate suffers acutely, extremely from EMF and cell tower radiation. And so her concern is that any new landline she wants a real landline she needs a real landline not one that just mimics a landline with a little bit of uh wireless gap that'd be a real landline uh all right edges our power is going out all the time or there are a couple of failures one that uh cell failure right when ATs try to get out of the landline business all cell phones fail last week uh also a failure that did not make the news our landlines could not reach any Verizon cell phone for uh, five days. Uh, I never figured out. I called both ATT and Verizon and neither one of them. Day after day after day, I couldn't find any information on a major failure. Uh, so, and then lastly, uh, 
Oh, so, so I want to make sure any landline, whatever alternate future fiber, whatever is free of radiation and immune power outages. That's a must have. And lastly, um, who defines the viable alternative? And it would be possible to get your phone number. Uh, we don't want to go through all that AT&T uh, runaround. Did you have a phone number you can offer us? Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. Um, our family has one of the very few landlines left in our rural Santa Cruz Mountains neighborhood in an area that is blue on your map. And uh, there is no alternative. There is no cell phone service. And I like it that way. I also suffer from EMF problems. And it's very hard to be here. But I'm here because this is important. Um, I don't trust AT&T to say that we'll take care of it. Because AT&T has not maintained the landline uh, cables over the years for the last 15 years. There was a, and this, the PUC reported that in 2019 and said that AT&T and Frontier had allowed uh, through neglect that the, the lines and service had deteriorated. That report was kept confidential until 2020 when CPUC said you have to um, give a public report redacted of that. And that was verified that at and has not maintained the lines. We have paid for the service, but we have not received the service. Our landline has become very noisy um, when it rains. And um, when repairmen do come out, we, we have to wait usually a month after uh, we call in with the problem for anyone to come out. But they can't figure it out because the lines are in such bad shape. There's no way they can isolate the problem. So I want to um, say that probably some of the reason people have dropped to the service is because it is such poor service. It is reliable service. It's better than nothing, but it's got to be maintained. And I'm asking AT&T to maintain the service. Also, a lot of people on fixed incomes have been forced to drop it. I want to bring out that there has been a 17-page motion for dismissal of your application filed by the CPU, uh, C CPUC Advocates Office, and nobody's talking about that. That was discussed at the Ukiah meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ever. Right, is there anyone in chambers who has not already spoken on this item that would like to speak at this time? If so, please step up to the podium. Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll go back to online to see if there's anyone who has not already spoken on this item that would like to speak who is joining us online today. Yes, sure, we have speakers. Caller user one, your microphone is now available. Marilyn Garrett, the main challenge is the structural domination of the corporate state. There has never been more corporate power, in this case, AT&T, than in our society today. Um, I, I would like that phone number I just heard stated by the AT&T rep that anyone who wants a phone, copper landline in our area, they can. She would facilitate it. Give out this number, as Rick McLeod just requested. Give it out now. I know people who have tried to get a copper landline, and they were refused. I'm calling you on my only phone, my copper landline. By the way, item eight also has to do with AT&T making more profit. Cell phone microwave radiation makes me ill, as do the multi-sources of radiation emitting Wi-Fi antennas, 5G pole, and ocean water laptops, et cetera, at the county government building. Having attended board meetings in person for over 20 years, warning and providing documentation of cell tower smart meter radiation harm, um, which you have 
evidence you have studiously disregarded. I am relegated to phoning into the meetings now. I did go into the building briefly on February 2nd to deliver, hand deliver five copies of a formal protest of AT&T's application to remove landlines filed by Nina Beatty. You each have copies of that. The AT&T rep talks about um, alternatives in the protest I submitted, page five, Copper Landline is the only appropriate voice in Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Caller uses 7780. Your microphone is now available. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, this is Craig Chatterton. Um, thank you very much for the information. It's useful. Uh, but this, come back to the fact that uh, at and says that they're relying on the maps and the CPUC. My main big question here is why is mobile service considered to be an option alternative? Given the fires, earthquakes, and power issues we have, all the reliability issues are on mobile, why isn't the alternative restricted to, say, copper or fiber, uh, which are much more reliable and going to be much closer to the uh, reliability issues, reliability factors that we get today from our landlines? So if, the, if AT&T were instead restricting their blue areas to those that have fiber or cable, I suspect the, the numbers of people that they would see as being already served would be much lower and much more representative of what's really available. So I want to know why AT&T considers mobile to be an alternative. Uh, and there are issues with fiber and copper, meaning power reliability when it goes down. But that's one issue. Secondly, why isn't color separated from the issue of serviceability? If at and wants out of service, find another carrier that will provide color. That would be a much more powerful option for residents. Now we know we at least have someone who's on the hook and guaranteeing they're going to provide service. Cell towers can be taken down or moved or deprecated at any point in time by the carrier. Uh, they upgrade service levels and they reduce the range, and now all of a sudden you can't get service. Color is very important, and it really should be separated from service availability. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tim, your microphone is now available. Thank you so much. Um, Justin, your comments were fabulous. And uh, I just want to remind AT&T and, and Justin, all you need to do is smile and say, oh, what about that lead cable in Lake Tahoe? that's poisoning the lake and your lawyers are all wrapped up in court and everything. And everyone's pointing fingers at one another and arguing about the removal of the lead cable from Lake Tahoe. And all that water goes downhill to Reno Sparks and to the Fallon farmers and to the Naval base out in the middle of Fallon, Nevada and the Pyramid Lake Native American tribe. So, you know, AT&T doesn't have any shred of a record of being responsible to the communities here, you know, for in California or Nevada. So um, I think you should question them about that. Thank you very much. You Thank you. David, your microphone is now available. Thank you. Um, there was a lot of discussion about the end of a life cycle of technology with regards to landline communications. Well, I, I, I'm an engineer and I work in technology and while that's true for a particular application, it's very rare that a particular technology ever ceases to be useful for specific applications. For example, today floppy disks are still used on Boeing 747s to update the, um, the flight control software. I was also in a previous life, a Navy Submariner. Our communication at last resort was very low frequency radio. It was a wire that we pulled behind the submarine. It was how we got our nuclear launch codes. That technology is 
hundreds of years old, and the Navy still uses it today and operates a station that transmits in Dixon, California. <clears throat> As I sit here today, living in the Santa Cruz Mountains, it's hard for me to see how landline phone communication and its robust reliability in a power outage will, will be replaced with a modern alternative. Modern alternatives represent better performance under different circumstances, such as being in an urban environment, potentially. But, you know, much of Santa Cruz County and Santa Cruz Mountains aren't represented by that kind of topography. So I urge the Board of Supervisors to consider those facts. Thank you very much. Here, that was our last caller. Okay, well then I'll bring it back to, uh, well, first I'll thank uh, all the members of the public for the comments on this item. I want to bring it back to at and I know there are a number of questions that were asked about um, considering the consideration of mobiles as alternatives and why that's the case. Um, um, what about when power is out and how certain alternatives don't work when the power is out and then the maintenance of the current landline services, um, among other comments and questions that were made, but maybe that's a good starting point. I'm so, I'm sorry, sir. Can you can you repeat the question? Sure. Um, there were a number of questions that were brought up by members of the public. Um, one was asking about why is AT and T considering mobile as an alternative, um, and then uh, another individual mentioned that when power's out. Um, some of these alternatives don't work. And so what are some alternatives that might be able to function if the power's out? And then it sounded like there was a question about maintenance of current landlines and what is AT&T gonna commit to in terms of that? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the first one and then I'm, my, <laughs> my brain's a little full, so I'll ask you for help when we get to the second and third one, but happy to take the first one, which is why do we believe that uh, wireless technology or wireless um, is an why we believe it is an alternative to um, POTS telephone service, right? So plain old telephone service or POTS. So um, there are um, seven, seven out of 10 adults um, living in households have cell phones, have chosen cell phones over POTS telephone lines. So uh, a lot of our technology, a lot of um, our businesses, our daily lives, um, telehealth, service, government services are run over wireless technology. So there's apps for this, there's apps for that. So many people have chosen, um, again, I don't have a landline, I have a cell phone. So many people have chosen that as an alternative. And so... Um, there is fixed wireless, there's wireless, there's cable, there's VoIP, there's fiber. So there's many different product alternatives, and that just happens to be one of them. But we also recognize that it's, you know, it's not ubiquitous, right? Wireless coverage is not ubiquitous. It is very difficult to build cell antennas in some communities. You, you've heard here today that some people don't want them. And so we get opposition when we attempt to put cell antennas up to provide better coverage. There are people who don't, who don't want that. Um, and so it becomes a challenge for us in many jurisdictions to be able to get through the permitting process to place cell antennas. So in some areas, it's an alternative. In other areas, it may not be. Thank you. And then with regards to the member of the public who was speaking to how when the power is out, um, the one benefit of landlines is that they still function and whether or not at and is exploring any type of alternative that can maintain that similar function for when the power is out. Yeah, so... Um... So we, so there, there is, you know, if I call it a myth, if I call it uh, misinformation, 
there is this idea that your your landline is going to work forever, whether we have one day of power outage or 24 days of power outage. Our, our landlines are powered by what we have in our central offices. So we have backup batteries in our central offices. We also, if if you are VoIP, if you're a VoIP customer, we can also bring a generator to the box on the corner and power that box because there's batteries in that box that provide service to your home. But this idea that there's going to be an infinite amount of power coming to your landline um, because every time you go to it, you you know you've picked it up, um, and there's there is a dial tone. Um, there is backup power regulations for our central offices. It's not infinite. So if we had a very um, significant power outage, there may be a time where we don't have backup power. Our requirement is 72 hours of power for our landlines. That is our requirement. So there is this idea that it's always going to work in perpetuity. It's been on the wall for 60 years and it's going to work. Um, so there is um, there is a um, this belief that my my landline is always going to work. Um, that you know it may have worked, um, but there are situations where it doesn't. If you're in a fire and you're you're working to escape a fire. Your landline is going to be burned in a fire. Your copper wire is burned. Your telephone, I mean, you're not going to have a landline. You have a mobile phone. It's mobile. You take it with you. That's an option, right? Um, so. And then I guess the last question that came up um, that I made note of from members of the public was just around AT&T's commitment to main, maintenance of service because it sounds like some people even got rid of their lines because of the quality of service. And within the Kohler, one of the obligations is that AT&T is supposed to maintain uh, high quality of service. So how should we, you know, if people are having issues, do we have them call you or what's kind of the approach that AT&T is going to take as it relates to maintaining quality of service for these landlines that currently exist? Right. So the, the service quality standards are set by the PUC and we work hard. We strive to meet those standards. Um, and if somebody has a problem with their phone line, um, they can reach to AT&T and set up a technician to come out and service those lines. Um, none of that is changing. Our Kohler um, obligation, like I said, is, is still current. And the designation is still on AT and T to remain right now as carrier plus resort. And I guess since we'll have you all's contacts as well, we can reach out to you if people are struggling with getting somebody to come out and service their lines. Yes. Yes. Betty's phone number. Well, with that, um, I'd like to see, are there any further comments from board members on this item? Because I know we still have two more items in the item on closed session. No, thank you, Chair. I think we're good. Okay. Well, then, I'd just like to thank um, Ms. Rios and Ms. Saxon for taking the time to come and speak to the community and address us on these items. Um, I think it's people very much appreciate your willingness to be available and to, to speak to us on this item. So thank you all for your time today. Thank you very much. And thank you to the members of the public who who came today uh, to share their their their. Uh, voices their perspective with us. Thank you. Um, so with that, I'd like to just check in with the board to see if board members want to take a quick break um, or if we should just continue to power through. 15. I think we just got to keep going because all the people have been waiting. So, yeah. I think we're okay with, I mean, it's tough. I think we should just keep going. There's been people have been waiting this entire time, so. Okay. With that, then we will move on to item number eight, which is consider status report on the progress of Santa Cruz County broadband activities, accept and file the broadband strategic master plan and direct the information services department to return on or before September 24, 2024, with an update as outlined in the memorandum of the 
Director of Information Services. And with that, I will invite up Tammy Wagle, Director of ISD. Uh, thank you, Chair and members of the board. I'm Tammy Weigel. I'm the Director of ISD. With me today is Alan Plishenik. He is the head of our Business Analyst Office, and he also worked on this strategic plan with me. So glad to introduce him today as well. So just to briefly go over the agenda today, we'll do a brief introduction on broadband, um, quick review of the last strategic plan, which um, was presented to the board. Um, I will do an overview of the grant programs that have come up in the last couple of years around broadband. Um, then we'll dive into the broadband strategic plan. I'd like to do a little bit of an update on the affordable connectivity program and its impact in Santa Cruz County. Um, review some of our activities that we are going to be uh, engaging in the next six months, some of our long-term deliverables, and then kind of do an update of where broadband stands today as far as projects in Santa Cruz County. So I, I think everyone here knows the importance of broadband. I think that just the importance of communication during emergency events has really been expressed this morning. Um, so we, really, we depend upon it with the fires, with um, all the other events, communication, whether it's through a phone or whether it's through broadband is increasingly important. Um, the importance of broadband really came about during COVID. That's when we really saw a push for reliable broadband because we had students working remotely, we had people working remotely. And also too, we've seen um, the need for social inclusion. So there are traditionally groups that have been on the wrong side of the digital divide. So uh, such as lower income uh, individuals, rural communities, as we see today, as well as seniors. So back in 2015, uh, the county planning department worked with Design 9 um, and presented the first broadband plan to the board. Um, this plan was a rapid assessment of existing broadband, and it really was focused more on economic development um, with the following strategies um, to look at public uh, private partnerships, the use of existing middle mile infrastructure to expand business access to a last mile. And middle mile is what the last mile, what we get um, broadband to residents and businesses. So that is like the connectivity back to the internet. And then also there was a um, suggestion to build out dark fiber in an open access middle mile. And at that time it was estimated a cost of 2.2 million. So since then, there has been considerable interest and activity around broadband at both the state and federal level. Um, there are several federal and state programs that support broadband expansion in California that um, we are seeing being used in Santa Cruz County. Um, the first one I'd like to go over is the California Advanced Services Fund, better known as CASIF. Uh, this is managed by the CPUC and it's funded using surcharges on revenues by carriers. It's a recurring grant. And so, so as you'll see later on in this presentation, several of the carriers slash ISPs have taken advantage of this um, grant opportunity to expand broadband. There is also the California Middle Mile Broadband Initiative. This is going to be managed by the California Department of Technology, and it's funded by SB 156, which was the big um, broadband bill at the state. This includes approximately 70 miles of fiber in Santa Cruz County along highways 1, 17, and 9. I will note that Highway 9 was not originally included in this plan, and so one of the things we did at the county level is we did reach out to the CPUC and the CDT to have it included because we know of the broadband issues that are up in the San Lorenzo Valley. There is also the Local Area Tech Technical Assistant Grant, or aka LADA, which is also managed by the CPUC. Um, this was funded through SB 156 to support technical assessments and engineering, and this is what we use to in order to pay for our um, broadband strategic plan. So there was no cost to the county. Finally, there's a federal funding account, which is Last Mile Fiber Program. That's in accordance with SB 156 as well. And it's administered by the CPUC. Under this, uh, 10.3 million was allocated for providers to uh, Santa Cruz County to put in grant applications for. And the big one that is coming up is, of course, BEAD, which is the Broadband Equity and Deployment Program. Um, this was authorized under the federal IIJA 
to provide high-speed broadband to underserved, non-served areas. And in California, this is going to be managed by the CPUC. We did hear on Friday at a um, meeting that Jimmy Panetta and MBEP um, hosted that right now the state uh, plan has gone back to the NTIA for first approval. It will be coming back to um, California for objections. And so there's going to be an opportunity for what the state has stated for the county of Santa Cruz for us to be able to question the maps and also the proposal. So there is going to be an open um, opportunity for citizens, governments, and cities to be able to comment on that plan. So our strategic broadband plan 2023, um, again, we looked at the increased focus and we knew that we needed to update the plan. So we engaged uh, Columbia Telecommunications Corp, CTC, to update the plan with the following goals. We wanted to look at the effective use of grant funding. We wanted to understand the broadband brand gaps. We wanted to create mid and long-term plans for broadband in Santa Cruz County. We also wanted to look at some um, short-term goals to have some short-term wins to be able to uh, increase broadbands to residents, businesses, and anchor institutions. And also too, we wanted to identify potential broadband partners and the current assets and anchor institutions within our county. So ISD and CTC did an extensive analysis of the state of broadband of starting in late 2022 through 2023. So the data sources included, along with talking to the ISPs slash carriers themselves, we did extensive interviews with city and county governments. We did interviews with educational institutions, including uh, the County Office of Education, UCSC, Cabrillo, and the library. We did interviews with business groups. Uh, we also did a survey of nonprofit and business users. We conducted speed tests, which were on our website, with residents and businesses. We also did um, phone interviews with residents regarding broadband access and availability, and we oversampled in those areas where we knew that there are broadband issues. And we also took the existing data from federal and state resources. So here were the strategic uh, plan findings, and there's more detail in the actual plan itself, but this is kind of a summary. The county, while it's largely served by 120, which is considered the federal acceptable level for broadband, only the coastal region, about 28%, have access to fiber broadband. A significant portion of the county is limited to a single provider, and that's about 38,000 households. 21 households within our um, county lack high-speed internet. As we've heard today, service reliability in rural and mountain region is a key issue, especially during storm and other events. There is a high reliance in our, our county on cable broadband. And we're looking at uh, kind of what we're um, putting the level at for our eventual plan goal is to provide 100 to 100 to the majority of residences and businesses. Right now, the low figure on this is estimated at 537 million for a full fiber deployment. So our recommendations for the first six months is we to continue to expand broadband. We want to actually start conducting financial and business assessments for the plan use of BEAD, including partnerships, uh, being able to join in with other grant opportunities, looking at existing fiber and how we can use that, and other sources of possible revenue. We do want to continue to work with our regional carriers to improve internet access using a facilitation model. We have started to establish relationships with them, um, making sure that their grant applications do align with our needs and requirements here in the county. And we're also working with the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership, MBEP, to tackle affordability issue as a region with Monterey and San Benito County. We also, I want to mention that we work with MBEP on some of the grant uh, applications through CASIF. So uh, we're really trying to tackle this as a region as well. So longer term, we really, what we want to do is pursue a cost-effective hybrid approach to providing 100-100 which use, utilizes a mix of traditional fiber optics, wire technologies, satellite connections, especially in those areas, as we know, where geography makes fiber only expensive and longer to deploy. There is no one single 
answer to providing broadband. So we know that we have to work with a variety of providers as well as a variety of solutions. We also want to continue to research the potential for building county open access fiber that we could lease to carriers so that they actually the county would kind of a build it and they'll come approach. And so one of the things that we're looking with the safety project that's going down um, SoCal Avenue with CDI is we um, worked with um, Department of Public Works to actually provide more fiber than is actually needed for that project that we'll be able to be able to lease out for last mile fiber to providers. So ongoing, we're going to, as we said, we're going to continue to engage with city governments and educational anchor institutions for upgrades and ongoing needs and requirements. We all have the same requirements. And so we want to make sure that we're not doing redundant activities. And so one of the, the really positive things that has come out of this study is that we have built up some relationships with those organizations so that we can work together to get fiber to residents, businesses, and um, institutions. We do want to take measures to encourage competition for broadband services to improve offerings and cost. We want to facilitate conversations across relevant county departments to encourage efficient deployment of broadband technologies within our community. And then also working with MBEP, as I mentioned before, we want to continue to support grant applications for extending broadband in Santa Cruz County. So I'd like to do take a moment and talk about the Affordable Connectivity Program. Um, the Affordable Connectivity Program, ACP, um, was a government initiative through the FCC that came out during COVID that was designated to help lower the cost of broadband service for eligible households. And this was a huge step in the right direction for uh, eliminating the digital divide. So right now, that um, program is only funded until 20, April 2024. And basically, the FCC ended enrollment as of February 8th, 2024. There are two bipartisan congressional bills that are proposed to extend ACP with $7 billion. That's H.R. 6129 and 3565 in the Senate, but they are obviously are not, have not moved forward. If we were to lose ACP, about 11,000 households would be impacted if it was not extended. So this means they run the risk of losing broadband access. The biggest impact in our county to this would be within the 95076, where you're looking at between six and 7,000 households that are on, currently on ACP. And we are working with the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership with the California uh, CETF to review alternative options for residents if ACP is not extended. And these would, again, be encouraging the carriers to provide entry level um, options for these households that still maintain the level of broadband. So I'm happy to announce that we have some really positive things that are happening with um, broadband right now within our county. Uh, the map you see here shows that our, ca our carriers and ISPs have been really diligent about applying for CASIF grants. But as you can see, the almost our entire county, except for the urban areas, um, is covered in this map. So on February 15th, um, Cruise.io was awarded $5.6 um, million to, for their Equal access, access Summit to the Sea. And this also um, includes focus on areas that are less than 25.3 for broadband. And that's in Man San Mateo, Santa Cruz, Santa Clara, and Monterey counties. And we were very glad to see this move forward. Um, SurfNet for County Fiber, uh, which is a project for $11.8 million, would provide last mile fiber at Bear Creek, Scienti, and Empire Grade. This is pending approval, and the CPUC may want to move this into their FFA grant. So under the federal funding account grants, SurfNet has applied for three fiber projects in the county. Um, this is mainly in rural areas, totaling about $4 million. And then AT&T, as they've mentioned, has submitted five applications for projects in the county, totaling over $34 million on coastal fiber build-outs. And then ARPA, I'm uh, very happy to announce that Cruzaya will complete the ARPA funding project um, in the spring of 2024, with 19 sites now capable of serving over 7,600 locations within our county. And with that said, that ends our presentation, and we'll turn it over for questions. Great, thank you very much for that presentation. All right, I'll see if there's any board members who have questions on this item, uh, Supervisor Koenig. 
no questions. I'm just really excited to see some of the progress between, uh, well, I guess we, we expect the middle mile to be rolled out by the end of 2026, right? And That's then correct. How much longer before ISPs are actually be able to provide improved service? Um, off of that middle month. I would say it's going to be what there's real I'm projecting is right now I'm seeing is the end of 2026. So that would be sometime in 2027, though the CDT is reaching out right now to uh, the carriers to ask where they want to have vaults put, which would allow them to be able to pull fiber and other technologies off of that middle mile. So they are making progress. While we're not on the list right now, if you look at the CPUC, um, they are starting to work. And our county is only, I think, only five miles of it's going to actually be leased fiber. The rest is going to be built out. Okay, great. Well, I know people throughout the, our entire county are eager to see this improved service come uh, become available. And I applaud the efforts and I'm excited to see this move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, the original broadband master plan of seven or so years ago, the most recent one, and then the funding that ended up being awarded to Cruzio were all items that I brought forward to the board. And it's it's great to see this trajectory move forward. Uh, this collection of state and federal funding, and in particular, the large infusion through BEAD really does constitute the largest potential expansion of high-speed internet access to our community. You know. I worked in the very end of the Clinton administration in 2000, and we wrote a report about the digital divide then, and it really was for rural uh, communities, mainly within the central part of the United States. Most of those areas have actually been lit up uh, pretty well because of the of topography. And we have in our own community here, um, some of the most acute issues of a digital divide that I would say anywhere for anywhere else in the state, in particular in the rural areas of Santa Cruz Mountains and within parts of the South County that are in some cases less than a mile off of where there's a current fiber hall. My question for you, the, the 500 plus million dollars number is not a realistic attainment number. So, I mean, we're not gonna get yeah. there from state or federal funding. And fiber to home isn't a realistic option. And you had, you had mentioned uh, for a lot of these rural residents, and this was part of the at t conversation today, and you had mentioned that there needs to be a hybrid model, which I agree with. But so far, the CPUC and the funding focus has been on providing fiber exclusively mm -hmm. and not providing some of these other technologies that would help the rural residents. So how will we be able to apply that funding considering that there's local providers within the region, both Toronto or Cruzio, that have this capability now that could light up a large part of our community, how are we going to be able to apply our funding, meeting those requirements and still be able to, to meet the topography? I think one of the things to remember about BEAD is, and this actually came out from the NTIA representative that was there on fr the Friday meeting, is that while it's fiber preferred, it's not fiber specific. So there will be opportunities um, during the opposition phase, as well as when carriers be able to present their grants, they will be able to present alternative technologies. Um, we see that, again, that the Toronto wireless solution does offer some great opportunities for our county, especially in those areas where it's been hard to pull fiber or where point-to-point -point wireless has not been effective. So that is one of the things that, as a county, we should probably watch with the opposition um, phase to make sure that it is understood that fiber for us is just not a going to happen and it's highly expensive, especially when you're talking about in areas where Cal Fire has said it's going to be a high fire area. And that recommendation is to build it underground. And that definitely adds to the cost rather than just running it on a pole. Okay. I think that maybe as part of the direction today, if you're comfortable with it, recognizing that these master plans, strategic plans are really yeah. 30,000 30, foot views would be that we should proactively be prepared to already submit those comments. I mean, at the end of the day, we know it was submitted to federal government for review. We know when it comes back to the state, it's not going to meet the needs of our community uniquely. It's great for Santa Clara County. It's great for LA County. It's great for San Diego County. It's not great for Santa Cruz County. Yeah. And we, because of the topography and the two hour conversation we had preceding this, it's the exact same issue. Um, I think that we need to be very proactive in that. So if you need the additional direction, great. If you don't, I think there needs to be something that comes back to the board where we, we have a very formal um, 
statement on behalf of the county of why it doesn't work and why we why we need to have the flexibility here because i mean i know that surfnets had applications they were unsuccessful for because although it may be not fiber exclusive the reality is it's weighted so heavily that way they weren't scored highly so this is playing out of you know mount madonna and other areas and, and that we co-share in our districts um so I'll take your advice on, on the best way that we can participate proactively in, in getting those comments in. I think that's one of the ongoing uh, conversations that we're having with the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership is they are starting to build um, ways that not only the government, but also residents can uh, be able to express that, hey, I don't have good internet, fiber is not going to work for me. But I do think that we should, as a county, come back and I agree, say that this is not a workable plan. We're not going to be able to use bead um, money except in areas where it's easy to deploy fiber. So again, one of the goals of this plan is and is to be able to make sure that when we get funding, we get it in those areas. And unfortunately for the Santa Cruz County, those are areas where sometimes putting fiber in is not effective. So I agree. I think there really should be something back to the CPUC saying that this is not a workable plan if we were going fiber exclusive. Okay. To me, we should be agnostic on the solution because it's just about providing high speed internet access to folks and we shouldn't care about what the mechanism is. And for some reason, they've limited the mechanism. Yeah. I appreciate that. This work is, I know it's behind the scenes. It could be really transformational though for the families that, I mean, they can't access telemedicine. They can't upload mm -hmm. things for schoolwork. They can't tell, they can't telework. They can't really meet any of the elements of modern society because right now they're on satellite or services that don't aren't providing any sort of value to them. So I appreciate both of you, your work on this. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Chair. Supervisor, Supervisor Hernandez. Yes, I just I just wanted to ask too if there's anything, any way we can anything that we could do to support the um the affordable connectivity program or the ACA letter of support or anything that we could do i think that we should probably do that and have our partners like at mbep and the uh broadband consortium also probably do the same no i agree on that one and i know that there has been this is one of those issues where actually i think the carriers um county governments city governments are all on the same page we don't want to see acp go away so yes i think that would be appropriate to have the board have a letter back to um to Congress saying that this is a program that we feel is vital for our community, community and will just, if it goes away, will widen that digital divide. Uh, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Weigel and uh, your staff for, for being here. Uh, I like this presentation a lot better than the last one. I mean, as Supervisor, <laughs> as Supervisor Friend said last time, uh, you should come to, to us when there's a viable alternative. This is. Uh, not an alternative, this is a plan of attack. And this is encouraging because it seems like a lot of people are on the same page and identifying what the needs are and how we're gonna get there to uh, meet the criteria. And I think this expanding broadband services is really at the forefront of our equity work overall in Santa Cruz County. It's gonna be vitally important to everybody so they can communicate more. Um, and I think this helps us um, take advantage of state and federal funding, although the state funding is getting more questionable, it seems as the, the weeks go by. Uh, but um, I, I want to thank really just specifically Congressman Jimmy Panetta for hosting a broadband symposium in Boulder Creek recently in my district, uh, actually last Friday, uh, with representatives of the California PUC and the uh, N -N -I -N -T -I -A. Um There's a lot of to be done in the groundwork and uh, it's all inclusive and I really ad appreciate you're looking at all avenues of how we can get to the final answer as quickly as possible. It's gonna be a time, it's gonna take some time, but I'm really encouraged with the work that you've been doing and I appreciate it very much. It's gonna mean a lot to this community. Thank you. And I'll just share the comments made by my colleagues. I think this is a great, you know, step forward for our community that, that's been long in the making. And as we continue to make progress and keep progress on this, you know, we can ensure that folks will have access to, to internet in some of the more rural areas, but definitely something we're gonna have to continue to advocate for over time so we can ensure that it becomes a reality. So with that, I'm gonna close out um, questions from the board and I'm gonna see if there's any members of the public who would like to speak to us on this item. If so, please approach the podium and you will have two minutes.
Thank you for this good report. My name is Becky Steinbrenner. I would like to ask that um, this plan also incorporate um, fiber, continued fiber on Highway 152 to assist the Santa Cruz County Fairgrounds, the 14th DAA, to have improved broadband service. It is a problem. Um, that is our evacuation center for our county. And last winter, it was used by Monterey County. And when there are um, evacuations there with a lot of people or large events, they cannot handle, they, they do not have sufficient broadband service to handle the, the demand. Um, and it is something that uh, the new CEO, uh, Zeke Fraser, is looking into. Their board is meeting at 1.30 today. <laughs> um, so I'll try to uh, ask that he contact you. But it is certainly something that we should do to add for our county's emergency response. I would also like to ask that um, our county partners with any and all projects, such as Caltrans and PG&E work happening. Um, there's work on Highway 1 going on. There's um, PG&E is, is supposed to be undergrounding lines. Uh, let's put the, the broadband fiber in there with that and piggyback on that work. I do see many, many large cables of the fiber stored at the farm park area. And I'm hoping that that is being used for the uh, so SoCal to state park uh, traffic improvements there. Um, I wonder why the county did not ever put in the tower that had been planned and funded to go up in Davenport, the Semex plant. I saw the plans. I uh, talked with the um, contractor that was supposed to be putting it in, but it never happened. And that was about five or six years ago. Thank you. Thank you very much. If, if I just may really briefly, the, one of the things that I think is actually a misunderstanding, there's fiber everywhere in the county, actually. There's fiber going straight by the fairgrounds. The, this is privately held, and it's up to that individual provider as to whether or not they're going to do it. Anywhere you see a school, you can basically assume that there's fiber already because they get a special rate. Um, and the same on the, the digging, you know, part of that package that I've Anyway, it was, it was interesting because you opposed it seven years ago when I brought it forward, but but we have a dig once ordinance in the county already. So when these things are torn up by PG and others, it requires a contact to all these utility or all these providers to say, but the difference here would be whether or not the county actually publicly puts our own stuff down, which financially wasn't a viable option uh, seven years ago, but, but it exists. It's just a question of getting the providers to even provide just some services like the, um, like the fairgrounds. Sorry, Chris, go on. Hello, I'm James Hackett, Cruise IO Internet. Uh, I mainly wanted to just thank the county for working so hard on this issue. Uh, we've heard a lot today about the telecommunications challenges in our region. It's obviously a very real problem. Uh, Cruise IO has partnered with the county and others for many years to work on addressing this. Uh, as, as has been said several times, the solution here won't just be one provider or one solution technologically. It's going to be multiple providers, multiple solutions. The hybrid approach of fiber and fixed wireless really is the only solution that's going to work in our county. Um, it's important we continue to work with the CPUC and the NTIA, NTIA to make sure that they know that and that they know that uh, small providers need to be able to access these funds and that barriers to small providers accessing these funds need to be removed. Uh, Cruze is really excited to be part of the solution. We want to continue working with the county to make sure we can bring as much available funding into our county as we possibly can and continue to work on imaginative solutions for access and affordability so our whole community can have access to real broadband. Uh, thanks again for taking this issue so seriously. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Carl Guardino. I'm vice president at Toronto Wireless. Uh, to have full transparency, it's also my honor to serve for 18 years on the California Transportation Commission, of which I am chair. 
And I only mention that because the governor's executive order of 2020 called for universal service of broadband 100% of unserved and underserved families. And we are one of the five commissions and agencies in the state that he has tasked to make sure that happens. So this partnership with you is both my day job and my citizen service. But I'm here on behalf of Toronto Wireless today. I want to start by commending Tammy Weigel and her team for doing an excellent job on this effort. I know that you enjoyed the 156 pages of the of the uh, Columbia Technology Corporation plan as much as I did. Uh, but if not, I'll send you each a summary of those findings as well. Overall, they nailed it. Please look at page 87 as well as where they talk about the technological advancements that Supervisor Friend referenced as well that show that a combination of technologies can meet the needs. We can't forget the number one goal of the governor's executive order of Jimmy Panetta's work on the bipartisan infrastructure law was 100% universal service, all unserved and un underserved. As the good folks at the NTIA have asked us to remind people, the law is called Internet for All. It's not called Internet for Some. We don't want to be picking winners and losers. That's not equity, as Supervisor McPherson referenced for Santa Cruz County residents. So three key points, technology advances, finances are finite, and timely deployments matter. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is there anybody else in chambers who'd like to speak to us on this item? Seeing none, is there any, are there any members of the public on the on the internet who would like to speak to us on this item. Yes, we do have one caller. Caller user three, your microphone is now available. Marilyn Garrett, I don't have a computer. I don't want internet. I don't want your broadband radiation. Broadband means radiation. And you speak of closing the digital divide. Have you heard of digital dementia? Children who are in front of microwave radiation emitting Wi-Fi computers getting dementia connectivity. People, how about people having connectivity to food and housing? and a healthy environment. This is the opposite. I recommend you read the document, Bees, Birds, and Mankind Destroying Nature by Electrosmog. I am struck by the contrast of the previous agenda item where landlines and people can give computer access over their landlines are reliable and work and they should be maintained and offered to everyone to this toxic technology. I'm, it, it's just so outrageous. I strongly oppose measures like this, which mandate additional toxic microwave radiation assault and takeover of our public buildings, schools, and public right-of-way with fire-prone death towers by telecom corporation tyranny with no informed consent and in violation of our constitutional right to be safe in our person and property. This is a distortion and misuse of what should be helping the public. Thank you. I oppose that. Thank you. Um, are there any, it looks like there's another person in, uh, in chambers, but I just wanted to check, is there anyone else online? We have no further speakers online, Chair. Okay, you will be the last speaker on this item. Great. Good afternoon. My name is Gabriel Moran, and I'm with Toronto Wireless. First, I want to commend uh, Ms. Weigel on her fantastic report and understanding that a mixture of technologies will be needed to close the digital divide in Santa Cruz County. 
And it is an important lesson for the state of California more broadly in considering how it will make the most of its once in a generation of bead funds. I would like to highlight um, uh, Cruz.io, one of the internet service providers here in Santa Cruz County, who recently won a $5.6 million grant from the California Public Utilities Commission to serve 759 families in the county uh, and using that money to deploy open access middle mile fiber to uh, fixed wireless, specifically next generation fixed wireless service um, at a cost of roughly $5,000 per home. Uh, and when you compare that with other CPUC grants that have gone to fiber providers that uh, with uh, per home costs of upwards of six figures, uh, north of $150,000, uh, it is an important lesson uh, and important to recognize that uh, with finite finances, you have to choose the appropriate tool in the technology toolbox to meet the moment and close the digital divide for all. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, seeing no further speakers on this item, I'll bring this back to the board for action. And Mr. Chair, I'd like to move the recommended actions with some additional direction, if that's okay, and that's to direct um, ISD to come back to the board with a, a letter uh, of support for ACP um, that we can send out to our delegation. And also the last action item is a direct ISD to return on it before September 24th. I just want to amend that slightly to say that if, if NTIA comes back before then with comments, it'd be nice to have you come back before then with the board being able to direct those comments then as well. Thanks. All right, so we have a, a motion by Supervisor Friend with some additional direction, it was seconded by Supervisor McPherson. Um, is there any further questions or comments from board members? Okay, saying none, I'll turn it over to the clerk for a roll call vote on this item. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. I just want to thank our IST staff for all their hard work on this. And, uh, and with that, we'll uh, continue moving on to our next item. This is going to be the final item on our open session. Uh, item number nine on the regular agenda, consider report discussing an application of Santa Cruz County Code 2.31 Public Works Projects Declaration of Non-Responsibility in the county's current bidding process, discussion of project labor agreements and recommendation for a three-year pilot program using project labor agreements for up to five to be determined capital projects and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the county administrative officer and uh if you'll give me one sec um, this item will be presented by elisa benson uh peter detlef's principal analyst and damon adlo director of capital projects i'm sorry if i screwed up your name thank you mr chair uh good afternoon members of the board as mentioned today before you, you have myself, Elisa Benson, Assistant County Administrative Officer, Peter Detlifts, our Principal Administ Administrative Analyst within our office, and Damon Adlow, who is our Director of Capital Projects. I also want to just say we have a multidisciplinary team that's been working on this since your direction on December 12th. We have folks from GSD, Parks, CDI, our Workforce Development Board, and County Council, as everyone has um, put our arms and brains around this concept and how to bring it back to you. As quick context before I get into the table of contents for today's briefing, on December 12th, we had a board item that really had three different parts of direction. One was a re a requesting a report on non-responsibility issues and, and within our our county code structure for contractors, uh, either in selection or in uh, delivery, how we address uh, challenges of non-responsibility, basically poor performance, and then how that might be improved. So we'll be talking about that. We also had some direction around coming back with concepts for projects for a three-year PLA test and we'll be speaking to that. And the third part of the direction was for us to return in April with a proposed PLA agreement and associated policy recommendations. So that was the original order. And I'm going to speak a little bit first on the next slide. We can figure out how to do this. Oh, one too far. 
what we're going to cover today. And as you'll notice on the cover page, this is part one. We absolutely will be back at the first meeting in, in April uh, based on direction today with a, a fuller proposal. So today we will be covering the existing policies and practices. Damon's going to be talking about that. Um, an analysis of PLAs uh, as they've played out locally and in other counties and sort of general takeaways from that. Um, and those PLA considerations, adv advantages and disadvantages, Peter will be speaking to that. And then and finally, we'll be speaking to staff recommendations, and I'll be t taking that forward around a three-year pilot and some parameters we'd like to put before you for consideration to guide us in what we would bring back as a fuller program in April. So this is part one of a two-part staff briefing. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Damon. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, as Lisa mentioned, my name is Damon Adlau. I'm Director of Capital Projects uh, with Community Development and Infrastructure. I will be discussing the county's current policies and procedures and how Santa Cruz County Code 2.31, Declaration of Non-Responsibility, has been implemented, implemented in the bidding process on construction projects here at the county. Uh, the County of Santa Cruz's current bidding processes require a contractor to demonstrate that they are a responsible bidder prior to having their bid accepted for construction projects. A responsible bidder is one who has demonstrated the attribute of trustworthiness, as well as quality, fitness, capacity, and experience to satisfactorily perform the public works contract. A non-responsible bidder is one uh, who the county has determined does not have one or more of those qualities. When the county receives bids, uh, staff conducts a responsibility uh, assessment and analyzes every bid received. Uh, during that process, staff will examine the contractor's past public uh, works, pro, excuse me, past public works project performance, both with the county and other public agencies. In addition, the staff will review and verify the contractor's current good standing with the State of California Contractors Licensing Board for a period of five years. Uh, verify that the contract contractor is free of disciplinary to proceedings and or current suspensions. This analysis also in, uh, ensures that prevailing wage and fair labor practices outlined in state and uh, county code have been adhered to on past projects. Currently, the county has mechanisms in place to disqualify a bidder if they have been determined to be non-responsible. Next slide. Uh, the county also has the ability to review the contract for potential non-responsible findings during construction, as well as after construction closeout. If the contractor is found to be in violation of public contract code, Santa Cruz um, County Code, or the contract itself, the county has the right to disqualify the contractor from bidding in future projects for a minimum of one year from the date of the finding and a maximum of three years for subsequent findings for non-responsibility. Uh, to date, it has been rare for a contractor to be determined to be non-responsible once in contract. Current county processes have his, his, historically been successful during the bid review process in filtering out most contractors that have been determined to be a risk of, of performing poorly. Through outreach with local government agencies, it is, it is understood that it is uncommon for a contractor to be found to be non-responsible on public projects statewide, but there still is a risk. It is most common for public agencies, including the county, to utilize a design bid build approach for construction projects um, that require the owner to accept uh, the lowest bid. In the private sector, owners are able to, to uh, utilize a negotiated bid approach, but this method is typically not available to public entities. County staff is continuing, continually reviewing current bidding and contracting processes as well as exploring different available options in, or, in order to reduce project risks. One way to mitigate this risk in the public sector is through an alternative project delivery method, such as design build, uh, construction manager at risk, also known as CM at risk or CMAR, and job order contracting, uh, also known as JOC, two of which have been utilized or are currently being utilized at the county. Each of these are a few examples of project delivery methods that typically utilize a two-step process, uh, first step being um, a, a pre-qualification base, and then the second step being uh, submitting bids. 
This approach um, is an additional filter that helps ensure a responsible bidding pool. Inherently, there are risks with every project delivery method and contractual agreement. There are no, there's no panacea or magic project delivery method. With this in mind, staff utilizes a variety of tools depending on the individual project scope and complexity. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Peter Detlefs with the CEO's office, who will be discussing project labor agreements. Thanks, Damon. I'm here today to give you a brief overview of project labor agreements um, and outline a few of the pros and cons of implementing a PLA to support capital projects. As shown here, uh, PLAs are a col collective bargaining agreement between a contractor and building and construction trade labor organizations. The county would enter into a PLA when approving a contract for the construction of a capital improvement project. During the bidding process, bidders must agree to be bound by the terms of the PLA to be considered responsive, including prevailing wages and labor practices previously mentioned by Damon. PLAs establish the labor organization and signatory unions as a collective bargaining representative for all workers who are perform work on the approved capital project. Generally, <clears throat> PLAs require that most labor on the projects be performed by union members. There are several potential benefits to PLAs. They are used in the construction industry to set standard terms and conditions of employment on the labor pool for projects subject to the agreement. Supporters share that they allow for expeditious resolutions to disputes, helping to ensure that the project is delivered on time, on budget, and that safety standards are maintained. This is done by ensuring trained union labor is used on a project and that any disputes are resolved with binding arbitration. In exchange, laborers agree to not engage in strikes, walkouts, or work slowdowns. Certain provisions seek to provide benefits to the community, such as improving training through apprenticeships, recruiting members from disadvantaged communities into high paying jobs in construction, and ensuring small businesses have the opportunity to participate. There's also potential disadvantages of PLAs. As Damon mentioned before, the county's existing processes are designed to ensure qualified bidders deliver projects, but PLAs could overlay additional administrative activities to ensure compliance. PLAs could also adversely affect local contractor participation because of the requirement to utilize union labor and to pay into union benefit trust funds from worker wages. Smaller contractors, including minority and women-owned businesses, make up a large portion of the workforce in Santa Cruz County that may not be able to comply with the terms of the PLA and discourage bidding on a proposed project. Finally, PLAs have historically been used for larger projects with tighter deadlines. As most of the county's projects tend to be small to mid-size in value, there is the risk that receiving no bids at all on capital projects requiring a PLA. The board should weigh the potential benefits and drawbacks that might be achieved from adopting PLAs into the county's, county's bidding processes. I'm going to turn it over to Elisa Benson to further discuss a potential pilot program, along with recommended terms and parameters of using a PLA. Thank you, Peter. So I'll be reviewing the staff recommendation, and I'm going to take, so there's three slides here I'm going to be sort of describing our first, our proposal uh, re proposed recommendation for a three-year pilot some of the initial parameters of a program we would like your direction on, policy objectives we would like your uh, your direction on, and then a, sort of a quick overview of what pilot administration will look like. I'm gonna pause on each of these slides in fact, in, in case there's any questions or additional discussion that y'all would like to have. So the staff recommendation at this point is a three-year pilot that would be uh, comprised of five large capital projects um, that would be at the threshold of at least $5 million each. The pilot parameters in this case would be, these would be, uh, the pilot would be for select non-emergency projects that vary across county departments, including parks, public works, uh, whether that's roads or sanitation, as well as general government. So we get some experience in each of those project delivery areas with a PLA. We would also recommend excluding projects that rely on FEMA funding. As you know, this is already a complicated enough 
a venture for us at this point, and we want to um, try and keep that as clean as possible. And then I want to highlight that, as folks have said, there has been experience locally with the city of Watsonville having um, no bids received in uh, solicitations that had a PLA requirements. Um, and so we want, we are not sure that will be a problem given the size of projects that we're recommending. It's significantly higher than the Watsonville threshold, but it could be an issue based on the recent bidding environment that we have been in. So we wanted to put that forward for your consideration. Another aspect of this is uh, you'll see a recommended action around directing the CDI director to um, a go to the sanitation district with an invitation to participate in this pilot as well. We do think that there are a, a number of sanitation district projects that would be good candidates for being a part of the pilot. So that is part of the recommended actions we put before you today. And then finally, uh, as I mentioned, we will be coming back to the board on April 9th with a recommended project list for the three-year pilot, as well as the pilot PLA agreement for your consideration to really set us forward um, should the board decide to go in that direction. I'm gonna pause and see if there's any questions around the overall concept we're putting forward. And then there's some specific uh, policy objectives we would like direction on as well. I have a question, but if it's too specific, then punt it. It's on the the rebid if there are no bids. Um, what if you received one bid, but it was 50% over our engineer's estimate? So it was astronomically more expensive than what we had budgeted for, which just seems like happens all the time, by the way. Um, so is that too specific? And that'd be something you'd want direction on? I mean, to me, it strikes me that the goal here isn't just to, if you don't get a bid, the goal here is to also not dramatically increase the costs of construction because one of the commitments that's been made from those that are advocating for this is that this doesn't do that. And so in order to adhere to that, then I think that we should have a tenant in there that makes that a requirement. Otherwise, it should be able to be bid without a PLA. I think we we're happy to take that direction and formulate that more specifically in the program moving forward. We hadn't we heard some comments today around requiring three bids at a minimum, so you're not just going with a single bid, um, but I think I'd wanna take it back to our capital teams for how we would wanna refine that. Damon, is there anything you wanna say about that or do you wanna just wait till April? Yeah, there's similar models that we studied that have that type of language in it, but we definitely would want direction on that. There's there's different options, different parameters and uh, exclusions. Okay, I mean, my guess is that the board's will is that this isn't to increase costs, right? I mean, that's not, we just received a pretty significant presentation just two weeks ago about the fact that we have a massive capital issue. And mm -hmm. so I think that, well, whatever you want on the direction on that should should happen. Um, because I'm okay with one bid if it's within the estimate for a qualified bidder, right? It's not about getting three, it's about, it's about the number and then making it qualified, I think. Yeah, okay. we had started with no bids, but I think those conditions with that in mind are appropriate. Okay, thank you. And today, when we get bids that are way out of line with our expected costs, we always have to pause and determine whether we can actually do the project. So I think that's that's helpful direction for us to incorporate into the into the pilot. And Mr. Dutless had used the language in a previous slide that said small and medium-sized projects for the majority. Do we have a definition of what those are? How do we define a small or medium-sized project? Turn that over to Damon. Yeah, there's there is not a standard that we define, but typically in discussions, under a million dollars would be a smaller project, and one to five would be a, me a medium project, basically. Likely, I think. Yeah, we had okay. There's not a. a I understand. Standard, I just wasn't sure the scope that we were industry talking standard. About. I would say large is above ten million. Okay, thank you. Okay, and. Other, I was going to say, are there any other board members who have any questions? Yes. So. Um, Initially, I thought this was a that we were going to come back at the at the later date with a master PLA. Uh, but my question is, uh, what are the other counties' thresholds on the PLA that you guys um, looked at, both counties and cities? They are all over the map. Some are at a million, some are at five. So it really varies by jurisdiction. There's not a set formula. Is is there any that are master PLAs that you guys looked at for counties that what's their threshold? 
Let's see. I'm in that. And they're, they've been all over the map, right? I've, I, some counties were as high as 10 million, right? So. Which county was that? That was 10 million? Remember offhand, you know, and some of them started high and then lowered them over time. I think if I recall. That's San Francisco. San Francisco, Sonoma, I think did the same. What was that amount? Originally up at 10 and then they reduced them over time. To? Uh, it varies, right? 5 million, 1 million, right? So. There's, there isn't, they, there isn't they a phased standard. it in from 10 million <laughs> down to 1 million over time. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah th thank you for that presentation and for the cooperative effort you've had with the other departments of parks and public works and personnel. Um, I think PLAs per se uh, can create some questions, but I think you've really. Uh, Put some guardrails around getting this thing when my uh, estimation would, might get out of hand. But I think that there's really some proper um, guardrails. And I appreciate the commitment here to uh, work with uh, for county residents as well uh, to identify them as much as possible, as, as well as uh, those in the apprenticeship program. So I think mm -hmm. it's going to be very beneficial to the workforce in Santa Cruz County. Supervisor Koenig, any questions? Is there more? You oh, there's, we have a, we have at least one more substantive slide that I'd uh, like to walk okay, through, if that's okay. The presentation and sure. Can... Okay. Then this. Lisa, is... before we before oh, we move on, I did have absolutely. a question on this slide. So, I guess one piece of confusion I have is, um, it's a the the proposal is a three year pilot, but it's actually a proposal for five large projects because it seems like it could either go one of two ways. One could be that it's a three year pilot where projects that come up within this next three years could actually fall under a PLA or the, it seems like the board, I guess what we're looking for is do we just select five projects and, and go with that are going to occur within these next three years. So I'm wondering if you can just clarify that because, um, cause that it seems a little con contradictory, but maybe I'm missing something. And then the other thing that I was going to ask is that uh, given that this is a pilot, I'm just curious why we're setting the project price amount at five million because it sounds like there is an opportunity for projects within that medium range zone to potentially qualify under this the one million to, to to five and potentially over five. So why I'm just curious why we're restricting ourselves at five million if this is kind of like the time when we can see, you know, how many projects at one million could qualify under this, or maybe at two or three, you know, rather than going so high up to 5 million and not seeing how this could work at a lower price point. Sure, I'm happy to clarify our recommendation. We are recommending a three-year pilot with a select group of projects for which PLAs would apply. So we would be testing this for a three-year period to a select group of projects. Not all projects that the county do in the next three years, but a select group of projects in the next three years. Regarding the $5 million threshold, absolutely, if you all want us to look at other project thresholds, we're happy to bring forward that those alternatives. From our perspective, having at least five at, at at least five projects at five million each, and in some of the projects we're anticipating bringing before you would be significantly more than five million. Would provide a solid approach to understand how to apply these in a variety of different delivery areas. So we are we are open. Obviously, it's the board's discretion and decision if you would like us to apply this in at projects less than five million. Uh, with the other driver for us in this was conversations with the trades around wanting larger larger projects with significant amount of work hour, hours over multiple years to support apprenticeship programs. So that was part of our thinking in selecting larger projects with larger numbers of labor hours over time. But of course, this is the decision of the board. If you all would like us to try a project at a million or two at two at a million, we can do that as well. Or a mid-sized project, we can vary what we put in the pilot. We're just looking for that um, that specificity as we come forward with a project list on April 9th. 
So in this case, um, uh, Chair Cummings, the five million is a threshold. So some of them could be much larger. So they could be ten million dollar, fifteen million dollar projects. We're just setting a threshold of five million. Not that they would all be five million dollar projects. Five million in our recommendation is a threshold. Some of them may come in at ten million. Some may be even higher than that. Thank you. Okay, should I move forward to the next? Okay, the next one, this is really around, as we've heard, the primary objective of PLAs is really to provide um, high quality skilled labor in pursuit of high quality construction outcomes, timely and economical projects. But there's also opportunities within these structures to get at policy goals around workforce development and, and the local economy. So on this page, we are, have put forward a uh, two specific recommendations that we would want your direction on. One is this idea of local hire and the way we are recommending, we design that in the pilot program is that local hire is defined as from the Santa Cruz, Monterey County or San Benito counties. And, uh, and to do that with a tiered, two tiered approach where the first priority is for residents, worker residents of Santa Cruz County. The second tier would be preference for worker residents of San Benito or Monterey County. And then the third tier would be workers from outside of the Tri-County area, just to really drive home that policy goal of building a pipeline um, and workforce opportunities for folks here in our community. Um, the second recommendation is around the apprenticeship requirements that would be folded into the PLA. And that is that 20% uh, apprenticeship labor for the project. And then really this is that goal around creating the pipeline for our local resident apprentices to do work here in their community. So those are the two staff recommendations we would seek your approval of. The third item here, and you can see I put question marks, there are other opportunities to have even more focused requirements around serving a different groups, different vulnerable groups in our in our community who have maybe not have the same access. We don't have a specific recommendation on that today. And we really wanted to see if that was something you would want us to pursue to bring forward as an opportunity in April, or do we keep it a little more simplified at this point with the two sort of uh, objectives we set forward around local hire and uh, apprenticeship pipeline. So those are the other key elements we need uh, clear direction on so we can come forward with an agreement in April. Good, if no questions on that, okay. Lisa, Lisa, would you like questions now or should we? Um, I have one more slide and then we'll be at questions for sure. Okay, the next slide is just really quickly around pilot program administration. Clearly, uh, our teams need to get experience with this and how it's going to play through managing large capital projects. And this a pilot approach gives us that opportunity. We also anticipate we will be utilizing um, consultant project labor coordinator services to really help with both project by project uh, compliance and making sure we're getting the out comes we're looking for, as well as that consultant outside uh, perspective on developing and implementing programs that are embedded in the creation of the pilot. And then lastly, we want the opportunity to really collect some data locally. You know, does it have an impact on bidding? What does it look like for costs? Uh, we've seen studies all over the country where it varies by jurisdiction and really the conditions of their labor market and their construction environment. So we really need to get that on the ground experience here to understand the how PLAs can uh, meet the intended policy objectives. With that, I am compl we've completed our staff presentation and happy to take questions. Thank you for that presentation. Are there any board members who have questions for staff on this item? Mr. Chair, um, if I may, I'm sure. going to begin with the um, question for Director Adlow uh, about the non-responsibility stuff. Um, you know, my interest 
concern was peaked around this whole area of discussion that we're, we're talking about today uh, because of the long delay we've seen with the Live Oak Library Annex project. I mean, I think we're close to a year now. I mean, the core question here is what could we do differently in the future to prevent a situation like this from happening again? I think our typical processes, the filtering, so to speak, that we do during the bidding process I had mentioned has historically worked. When we're looking at the performance of a contractor in past projects, we're requiring them typically to have worked on projects for a five-year period. Generally, that's the best indicator to show that they will be a, respons a responsible uh, player. So to date, that has satisfied that need. Uh, moving forward, one of the things I mentioned is utilizing the alternative uh, project delivery methods. Um, that is a tool that is afforded to us. And what that does is an example, just to kind of simplify it, talking about a pre-qualification process, a step. It adds time, it adds money to a project, but that's, to me, in our current tool set, the best way to help uh, prevent that. Okay. And we had received, uh, the board received a letter from one of the subcontractors on that project concerned that they hadn't been paid even though uh, the uh, general contractor on the project had is there anything we can do just to our base contract to require some kind of um, you know subcontractor lien releases as a necessity for payment of the general contractor that, that's correct um, it would be building up our current contract to make requirements during payment um, more robust okay is that something you're looking at we are okay actively okay great um on the um so I, I know we have members of the building trades here and i'd like to be able to ask them some questions as well so um on the subject of project labor agreements so for the building trades uh the report said that plas have historically been utilized for larger projects with tighter deadlines that typically provide minimal returns on less expensive projects with the increased administrative costs and lower potential uh, for strikes or walkouts. Um, I'm just curious how, if one of you could respond to that. I mean, we had a lot of uh, the membership here today talking about, um, you know, re requesting that we consider a master PLA down to $1 million. Um, you know, clearly that's as, as has been explained on the lower uh, end or even small project size. I mean, how, how would you respond? So, uh, can I hold on once for one sec? Uh, I was going to mention this, that we did have uh, members from the building trades to talk about the staff, um, the staff recommendations, but I want to see if there's any questions for staff, because um, I'm going to give a little bit more time to the representative who's here from the building trades so they can kind of go through some of those um, items. So maybe if we could see if there's other questions for staff specifically on those last two recommended items, and then I can have the trades representative come up and give a more extensive um, uh, some extensive comments on what's been presented. Okay, of course, Chair. Um, well, I guess a question for staff. I was interesting to note in the report, uh, I think I understood this correctly, that with Watsonville's experience, you were suggesting that the, the private sector had actually been impacted because I, I guess presumably smaller contracts, contractors have gone out of business or just not been able to survive as well because uh, they're they're not being able to secure government work and therefore can't sustain themselves. Is that what was, did I read that correctly? I asked uh, Mr. Machado to come up and speak to that. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Matt Machado, Director CDI. And so to the question about Watsonville's experience, uh, they did share that with us. Uh, I don't know that I have any specific examples on those contractors, uh, but they've gone about 10 years without bids on some of their utility mm -hmm. projects. And they've had a fair amount of testimony from small contractors that have suffered greatly from, from those experiences over the past 10 years. But I don't have any specific names and project names for, for that example, though. Okay, thanks. Those are all the questions I had for staff. Thanks. Supervisor Friend. Um, I don't have a question, but they were seeking just sort of general commentary on on some of the elements of, I mean, I think that to the degree it fits with every other element that the board has been doing regarding uh, diversity and supporting local workforce development that I think that when you do come back in April, veterans, minority owned, women owned, I mean, I think these are important 
uh, to have these these considerations as as part of it. I mean, again, the point of this action shouldn't be to exclude anything, right? It shouldn't be to add cost or exclude. It should be to, to bring forward the benefits that the trades have been committed that this would bring forward to. And so I think that then there should just be parameters to ensure that that, that, that happens. I mean, I, I believe that it's true. I just want to make sure that we have those elements. And uh, so I'm comfortable with those final slide suggestions. Supervisor Hernandez. And I think I'm okay with those, um, you know, the targeted local hires, the apprenticeships. And I'd like to ask, though, uh, do we know the sort of the demographics of the local labor um, in terms of like where they're from, uh, veterans, stuff like that, like on the third uh, suggestion that we have? Um Overall, I'd like to see just a little more collaboration between labor and staff, too. I'm not sure if that question would be for staff or... So we don't, we don't have um, demographics okay. for the trades-related workforce on hand. That might be something that, that the trades unions can present, but we don't have those on hand, on hand this, at this table. We can also check with our workforce development staff around what they understand around the demographics of the construction trades workforce. Thank you. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I, I just I, as I mentioned before, I, I know a lot of work has gone into this, and I think you've got to a nice center spot on this. Uh, and especially as it relates to uh, prioritizing county residents and uh, apprenticeship programs, those are in that. I think it's um, a very good balance. Um, I'm very impressed with this. I mean, this hasn't been an easy uh, recommendation to come to, or maybe it has been because it uh, seems like there's been a lot of collaboration getting here. So I'm very encouraged by that. And uh, I'm very supportive of what you're presenting. Um, I'm just wondering, Elisa, can you put up the last, the second to last slide? Because I had some comments and questions on that. Sure. Let's see if we can do that. So it would be on the, uh oh, on the, oh, wrong. Oh, wrong one. <laughs> it's going to be on the uh, the policy objectives slide where we're focused on uh, the local, local hire and apprentice, apprent one back from here. Apprenticeship requirements, and then that question of uh, a I different. Have, I don't have it in mind. Okay, let's see. There we go. Okay. Yes, Chair Cummings. Are you able to see it? Yeah, I can see it now. Yeah, and I also um, I know that like as I mentioned before, there's represented from the trades because I was speaking with them about how this kind of fits in and there were some concerns that were brought up but i do think that you know the objective is to try to really um you know get people who are experiencing poverty who have been underrepresented to get in with the trades so that they can have access to these kinds of opportunities so just figuring out how to operationalize that i think it's really important that staff is working with uh the trades to really figure out how you know they're able to meet those those goals um within their kind of recruitment process um, that will ultimately meet the goals of what the county wants to see as well. And then can you go to the last slide? Yep, you, this one, pilot administration. Yeah, um, so the one, so this actually brought up some questions for me, not so much regarding this program, but just what does the county do currently to kind of track where contractors currently are hiring and where the people, where their workforce lives, you know, are they, you know, paying prevailing wage and these different aspects, because it sounds like, you know, we want to get, you know, oversight for unions, but a lot of times where the oversight has, has been, you know, needed in, in the past has been with non-union contractors, just broadly not calling out anybody here specifically, but, you know, trying to make sure that non-union contractors are compliant has been an issue in, in, in the past. And so I'm just kind of wondering how we're tracking, you know, we, we're putting all these requirements or, you know, hopes and desires on the unions and this PLA, but I'm just wondering, do we have something similar in place for non-union? Because we don't, I don't think we should be creating a double standard here. Um, you know, we should, we should be making sure that both our union and non-union contractors are, you know, trying to hire locally, increase diversity and all those other things. So just wondering what's, 
what's happening currently with non-union contractors. I'm going to let Damon has much closer proximity to running these projects. Yeah, so uh, typically projects are registered with uh, DIR, mm -hmm. and that allows um, us access to that information, as well as through the bidding process, um, the steps requiring uh, bidders um, to submit and attest uh, to hiring locally. But beyond that, that's currently um, the type of controls that we have and type of information we're able to access. <laughs> If I could add on to that a bit, um, so all of our projects do require certified payroll, and we do check those to ensure that the prevailing wage uh, rate is being paid, and that's both for state and federal project or funded projects, and which apply to all of our local projects. Uh, I will add that um, local contractors, what we see, especially in horizontal projects, uh, they certainly have an advantage. So we know uh, project by project. Uh, who's local, who's not. And uh, I would say on the horizontal, small to medium projects, the predominant contractors are local. Their advantage is, is mostly due to mob costs, you know, with heavy equipment, things like that. So, so we do see that as an advantage for the local contractors. And so we don't track it uh, per se, even though we do have a list of all those contractors for the last, you know, hundreds and hundreds of projects that we could pull together if the board is interested and seeing where those contractors are from, we certainly have that data. We just don't track it as a database. Appreciate that, those comments. I, I do think though as well, because it sounds like where we're moving with the PLA is, and maybe I'm wrong on this one, is, it, is tracking where the labor is coming from. And I think that's another critical piece because you might have a local contractor, but where's their workers coming from? And if that's something that we're gonna impose on the unions, you know, I think it's that we shouldn't be, you know, we shouldn't have one standard for one group of folks and another standard for another. And so, um, but I'll leave my comments there and we can continue the conversation. But I did want to invite up um, Casey Van Den Heuvel, who's with the uh, Santa Cruz Monterey Building Construction Trades. And um, I know we've been in conversation a lot with uh, the Building Construction Trades. And so I just wanted to give uh, Casey an opportunity to respond. Um, I think he's going to need more than two minutes just because there's a lot in here, but um, really wanted to give the unions a chance to respond. I know that staff only had one opportunity to meet with the unions. And I think if we're going to try to have something that's going to be effective and successful, we really need to um, hear from the unions and their experience and, and how we can make this an effective program for Santa Cruz County. So with that, I'll turn it over to Casey Van Der Hoogle. Thank you, Justin. Um, I would also like to submit to the board uh, facts and myths around project labor agreements with actual cited sources. So if you guys would like to see this, it's right. Please uh, double check those cited sources. Um, I appreciate the staff's ability to bring this report. Um, after reading the full report and the full agenda item, I definitely had some concerns with the report. Um, setting a threshold of a million dollars for a countywide PLA project offers numerous advantages over a higher threshold. It invites a larger pool of contractors to participate, promoting healthy competition. This increases competition, can drive contractors to submit more competitive bids, and ultimately benefiting the project and taxpayers. Smaller, medium-sized contractors may have been excluded by a higher threshold and can actively participate. In conclusion, a million-dollar threshold for a countywide PLA provides a balanced approach that maximizes competition, encourages diversity, and stimulates the local economy by ensuring, ensuring continuous supply of skilled labor through certified apprenticeship programs. The, the strategy not only benefits individual projects, but contributes to the overall growth and sustainability of the construction industry within the county. One of the staff recommended is that it adds an additional layer of bureaucracy that may not significantly enhance these outcomes. In fact, it can streamline the process and foster efficiency. PLAs are designed to establish a clear standardized terms for all contractors involved in the project, providing a structured framework that can be reduced administration burden. This standardized approach that contractors are on the same page, promoting smoother workflow and the need for constant micromanagement. Plays often include provisions that facilitate collaboration and communication between stakeholders. 
Fostering a more comprehensive work environment, this can lead to a quicker decision making and issue resolution. Reducing the bureaucratic red tape that might arise in projects without such agreements. PLAs can favor non local contractors, or sorry, PLAs can favor large non-local contractors undermining the county's goal to support local businesses and development local labor. The assertion that project labor agreements exclusively favor large non-union or no, large non-local contractors is misleading. In fact, PLAs are designed to ensure fair and open competition, promoting the involvement of all contractors, including small to mid-sized businesses. These agreements establish a level playing field by implementing standardized terms and conditions fostering an environment where contractors of various sizes can compete based on merit. PLAs contribute to the county's overject objective of supporting local businesses by encouraging a diverse pool of contractors, which in return stimulates local economic development and labor growth. During their report, they said that historically have been used for larger projects with tighter deadlines, and typically provides minimal returns on less expensive projects. I wanna reference some local PLA and county PLAs that were being discussed earlier. Santa Clara County, a $2 million threshold. Their annual budget, $10.9 billion. Almadena County, $1 million threshold. Annual budget, $4.1 billion. Costa County, $1 million threshold. Annual budget in 2023, $5.5 billion. And the San Francisco County PLA, which is a 20-year PLA, $5 million threshold for the first year, $3 million threshold for the second year, and then a $1 million threshold thereafter for the next. Their annual budget of $13.7 billion. And am I excited to say that City of Hollister that just passed their community workforce agreement has a threshold of $250,000. And this is gonna be able to provide a longer range of opportunity for statewide apprenticeship programs and actually obtaining these hours for these apprentices to foster the next round of skilled labor. Okay. The potential administration complexities that introduced also warrants consideration, staff said. One integrate, once integrated into the policies bidding procedure, a PLA requires little time to administer. The key to the success of a PLA administration is to include the PLA in the bid packet. That requirement that the bid submittal by the general contractor include an assigned addendum A, an agreement to be bound. The general contractor should then follow the same procedures when subcontracting bidding. This way, everybody understands the rules up front and the burden to gather the signed addendum A's rests on the general contractor rather than staff. The local building trades make sure that all aspects of the PLA are being adhered to. This does not place any burden on staff. During their one of their full reports, it was really concerning that they cited a survey that was done by local contractors and businesses that have historically been involved in implementing public work projects for the city of Santa Cruz. So yeah, we'd like to see that survey, right? But we got a hold of that survey and 29 contractors were conducted that survey. 90% were non-union. Four of those contractors have never registered as a prevailing wage contractor, which some of those contractors actually spoke today. That registration fee goes to compliance for the state. So I understand why they would not want to pay that registration fee. 11 of the 29 contractors that filled out that survey has never filed certified payroll within the county in the last five years. Six of those contractors had serious OSHA violations and failure to abide by workplace safety regulations. Now my favorite, 12 of the 29 contractors over 41 surveyed, 41% surveyed, had civil wage and penalty assessments for labor code violations filed against them with the State Division of Labor Standards and Enforcement. 
that total is close to $1 million just by these 12 contractors in wage violations. So in short, I think that survey is very flawed and does not represent good contractors. And this is the type of homework that you need to do before hearing from these types of surveys. The city of Watsville has a project labor agreements ordinance since 2013. We signed that agreement in 2014 in September. Discussion with staff revealed that several types of projects for sewer and water projects have been installed for 10 years due to the lack of bidders to the projects. This is completely false. Do you believe that council would allow a 10 year backlog? City staff also noted that PLAs have had an impact on private development projects due to smaller non-union contractors being able to underbuild to compete in the local market. The PLAs do not restrict these contractors to bid this work. I do support a lot of the key parameters in this agreement that staff has presented, but there's a lot that I don't agree with. We only have conducted one meeting for one hour. We have not negotiated in good faith and over a longer period of time. Some of the stuff that we do that they're recommending is already implemented, like the 20% of hours being done by certified apprentice for the classification. That is already a state requirement and should already be being trapped. One of the things is local target hire. As us unions, we have direct entry for veterans and trade prep program graduates which we have one here with the County of Education. We have one with an adult program in Watsonville, and we have one through the Monterey County Santa Cruz Building Trades Council. Our hiring requirements are set with the Division of Apprenticeship Standards. To change that, we would lose our accreditation that we've worked so hard to achieve. One of the, one of the suggestions is targeting people without a high school diploma. We would not be able to do that. The DAS requires us that our, our applicants have a GED or high school diploma. To be able to obtain these high skilled jobs, those are the basic requirements. So I think we need more time and we need an outline of a million dollar threshold with a term of five years and to negotiate in good faith and bring that back to this council in June. Because negotiation doesn't just happen overnight. And education of these project labor agreements does not just happen overnight. We need to sit down and negotiate in good favor. Thank you for your time and consider my recommendations. Thank you so much. Mr. Chair, if I may, sure. um, this doesn't really seem to be a productive discussion right now. I mean, it isn't. And so what I'm hearing, and I think that what we should do is just move to table this item because at the end of the day, there should be more discussion with Casey. That's fine. But you know, this isn't a one-sided discussion either, Casey. I mean, there should be discussion with with, with uh, some of the small businesses that called. I mean, this isn't just a one-sided discussion. And so if it's not ready for prime time, which is the distillation of what you just said, that's fine. But we're not going to this is not going to move to a productive discussion today, Mr. Chair. I think we should all recognize that this needs additional time, additional outreach of folks that feel that they weren't heard on the union side and people that called in earlier that had other points that needed to be raised on the local business side. So I'm comfortable with, uh, actually I'll ask counsel of what the proper approach with that would be, whether it's just a no action, it's a direction to do that, or whether it's a tabling um, in order to, this is a request for June. That's fine. Uh, whenever the month is, that's fine. I think first we need to take public comment. And then once it comes back to the board, uh, any of those, uh, all of above of what you just outlined is available okay. within the discretion of the board. You can, you can reject staff recommendation and, uh, and say that you want something to come back in June. You can give specific parameters around what you want to see come back in June. Um, and and I think staff would benefit from as specific of direction as your board could provide with what it is that you want to see happen between now and June so that we can bring back something in June that is directly responsive. 
Okay. And then Mr. Chair, then I'll just suggest then moving forward, if we, I mean, taking additional public comment at this point, it's like, it's just like a point by point refutation of every point in there. That's not, it's just not a productive discussion. So no, I, I do understand that, but it was an agendized item. And, and so I'm not, I'm not uh, debating okay, that. So I'm just saying to... that it shouldn't be a 10 minute. I mean, at this point, then I think we need to adhere to our time limits, right? Yeah. yeah. Because others were afforded two minutes that had points to raise as well, right? So I think that if we're having a discussion here, we should honor the two minute limit then moving forward. So there's some equity in that discussion. So that's fine by me. So with that, I'll open it up to see if there's any member of the public who has not commented on this item yet today. If you are in chambers and would like to speak on this item, you will get two minutes. I do have a few questions though still that okay. got raised. So the third, you know, the, uh, consultant that would be used, would that be third party could, house? Uh, Supervisor Hernandez, maybe we could get through public comment. We can still bring this back. Okay. To your questions. So let's move forward with, with public comment. All right. Good afternoon. My name is Ron Cheshire. I've been in the construction industry for over 47 years. I've been a rep for the Carpenters Union. The CEO of the Monterey Santa Cruz Building Trades Council, Director of Apprenticeship Training for Apprentices. I'm not here to debate anything. You asked a question. You want to know what we're doing within your community. Casey already told you a couple things. We've been working in this community for decades. We've brought pre apprenticeship programs to the area, we've opened them to everyone in all the communities. We have specific agreements. Actually, we, we've worked with the County Office of Education. Your Workforce and Development Board Director was here earlier today. He, he couldn't stick around. He's for pre-apprenticeships. He's for working together, making job opportunities to make better citizens for you here in this area. We work with disenfranchised communities. We work with people that have been in bad situations. Okay. The breakdown, the ethnicity, we could give that to you. I guarantee you, I can almost give it to you right now. In Santa Cruz County, it's probably about 60% uh, Latino, Hispanic. Uh, and then I can't get down to Pacific Islander or whatever, but uh, in Monterey County, it's it's a higher percentage. Uh, we We search for women to do this. We search for veterans. We have a rough time getting both groups in. OK, but we look for them specifically to get them involved and get them into good careers. We don't leave a stone unturned in this community, in your whole county, in regards to anyone that wants to get into construction. We'll work with them to try and get them into it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ron Smalling with Operating Engineers Local 3. Some of you know me, some of you don't. I find this to be a great conversation. With that great conversation, we didn't have the opportunity to talk to these three. Apparently, non-union did. So here's my card. I'd like to see you all, gentlemen, behind there. Tell them to come see us. We're down there. And we're, uh, Cat Casterville, come on down. Let's have a conversation. You three want to know something? We'll tell you up front and honest, like Casey did today. He'll give you the paperwork. We're not scared of any questions that you have, but we want the people in Santa Cruz County to have benefits, to have health insurance, to have retirement. That's a huge step into anybody's life. Now, my son-in-law just got out of the military. He's in operating engineers. He's in apprenticeship. He's got insurance on my daughter, my grandson, and himself. That's huge. That's a worry that he does not have to worry about. And you know what it costs for a veteran to join the operating engineers? $5. So if you got a veteran, send him to me. I'd help him because I'm a veteran.
worthy chair, worthy supervisors, thank you for giving the opportunity to speak here. Uh, Manny Pinero, CEO of Monterey San Cruz County Building Construction Trades Council, retired operating engineer as of today, the 27th of February, seven years. I got to go at 55. There's great opportunities here and a PLA for local people. Fortunate enough, I could stay in Monterey County where I was born and reared and still there 62 years later. The opportunities here and by encouraging and entertaining a PLA for the County of Santa Cruz help a lot of young people, help them establish to stay here where the roots are, a good wage, a good benefit, and dignity when you retire. So let's continue these talks and uh, hope you can make a decision today that we are gonna go forward. So thank you for your time. Thank you. This works. Good afternoon, supervisors. Uh, my name is Steve MacArthur. I represent the plumbers and steam fitters. I'm the business manager for Local 62, cover Monterey and Santa Cruz County. I have a great apprenticeship program in Casterville at our training center. I welcome any of you to come by and see it anytime, 8 to 4 30, Monday through Friday. We're there. Um, I would just want to give a couple of points, uh, you know, try to be quick, but, you know, any contractor can bid these projects, PLA or not. There's plenty of examples, even here in Santa Cruz, the Santa Cruz Metro, um, the sheriff's facility were both PLA projects and they were done by non-union contractors. So any contractor that says they can't bid it is totally lying to you. They can, any contractor can bid these projects. There's nothing in it that says they can't. Um, I would argue their whole made up theory about the increased admin costs. You know, you could use, you could save all the time in doing wage compliance. And for that one little part about putting it in the PLA language into the bidding documents, um, the whole fantasy about it costs more. I'm not buying it. There's, you can go over the hill the other way to San Jose. Um, they bid a project, a, a nitrification clarification rehab project. With a PLA, it came in 39% under the cost estimate. So the other way, they had one in 2016 that just finished in 2022, $100 million project for their digester and thickener project. It was 29% over budget without a PLA, and it still came in $100 million over budget by the time the thing was finished. So there's plenty of examples, PLA, non-PLA. It has no effect on the price at all. It's all prevailing wage. You have to pay the same amount. The material costs the same. It's all down to the contractor. I'm trying to get local people to work here locally. They want to work here locally. Um, thank you for your time. They don't want to drive over the hill to get a job. Thanks. Thank you. How you doing? My name is Danny Rubio. I'm with Shimano Workers Local 104. I'm an organizer. I've been at trade for 25 years. The last two as organizer. Well, the last 20 years, I've been driving to San Jose because it's not a whole lot of work uh, around this area. A PLA would help uh, people like me growing up in Monterey County. You know, when I was young, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was good in my hands. I couldn't afford to go to college. Um, I wasn't smart enough to go to college, but the building trades helped me um, find my way. And it's one of the best things I've ever done. And it's the opportunity they gave me to provide for my family, for having my kids, and uh, buy a home and stay in Monterey County. So um, I hope that you consider PLA and uh, give these kids an opportunity that either don't want to go to college or can't afford to go to college. Um, give an opportunity to be productive members of this, uh, this community. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in chambers who'd like to speak to us on this item? Good afternoon. My name is Paul Bruno. I'm the CFO and a principal of Monterey Peninsula Engineering. I sent an email yesterday. I hope you had a chance to look at it. It outlined what happened at your December 12th meeting. Please recall that board direction from that meeting initiated the review of the counting bidding policies and led to the proposed actions before you today. At that meeting, Supervisor Koenig made statements that include outright falsehoods about our family business. When I inquired of his staff about his statements, I was stonewalled. The question you should ask is why was the impetus of these policies changes based upon misrepresentations and outright lies? 
Or better yet, you should ask why can't these bidding policy changes stand on their own merits? Perhaps it was falsely presented as a worker protection measure to keep anyone from noticing that absolutely no financial impact analysis has been conducted. A few years ago, the city of Seaside was considering a PLA. A capital improvement budget analysis showed that the PLA would cost that small city upwards of $26 million more over the next five years. What would it cost a large county such as this? The county needs to look at Watsonville. Their 10-year experiment with the PLA has been ex an absolute failure. It did not produce more local jobs or training opportunities. It did not increase apprenticeship. Worse yet, the PLA has impeded their ability to contract much-needed work. You should listen to them when they tell you they're telling the truth. An informative pilot program would bid several projects side-by-side -side with and without a PLA. That way you can tell the difference. I suggest the county take no action until it observes Watsonville's how it proceeds with modifications to their PLA. There's no need to rush this through. It's a solution in search of a problem. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. I promise you I'll keep it quick. I got a three hour drive after this. Um, so my name is EJ Sire. I'm a political and public relations representative for Local 104. We cover the northern 49 counties. I cover the coastal counties from Ventura all the way up to the Oregon border. And I do this in all of those counties, but all the way down to school board level, all of the above. Generally speaking, whenever we see a situation like this, it's either because staff has inserted their own opinion into a project labor agreement discussion, or there hasn't been enough meetings. Obviously in this case, there has not been enough discussion as was pointed out earlier. And I was obnoxiously relieved to hear you just from the get go, notice that it, it's definitely a relief because generally we don't have that. So just to, to make it real quick, um, you know, when you're talking about the diversity and inclusivity and all that, I, I'm on the board of directors for Rising Sun Center for Opportunity out of Oakland. It's a program focused on specifically underserved, underrepresented, disadvantaged communities. Um, on top of that, you mentioned the veteran status. I'm a disabled veteran. I was medically retired after eight years of service. I have 22 disabilities and the sheet metal worker still found a way for me to come into the trade, work with my hands. I spent five years as an apprentice. I built 80% of the duct work for the Salesforce tower in San Francisco with these hands right here, right? I have something to be proud of for that. As a veteran who thought that I was done, uh, myself, my wife, and my four kids, we almost ended up homeless in 2017. The only reason why we didn't is because the local school district, the community college district to where I live, signed a project labor agreement, which required local hire, which meant they had to look for local applicants which was me. So now myself, my wife, and my four kids are comfortably in the middle class with healthcare, retirements, prevailing wage, a family sustaining wage. That's all we're looking for. So when you look at a PLA, whenever it comes back in May, June, whatever it is, make sure that those facets are put in there, the prevailing wage, the local hire, and the apprenticeship programs. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, I'd like to ask if there's anyone online who has not already commented on this item. Yes, sir, we do have one caller. Okay. David, your microphone is now available. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair and Supervisors, and thank you for your consideration of this item. My name is David Vincent. I'm a proud local sheet metal worker. I appreciate the councils proposing to move above and beyond the public contract codes requirements of responsibility to ensure, to ensure that only the most qualified and reliable contractors are able to use our taxpayer monies to complete the public works projects in the Santa Cruz area. Additionally, I believe that the proposed use of a project labor agreement will augment the development of a skilled and trained workforce in the area prioritize local workers for opportunities within the area, as well as those traditionally excluded from these sorts of opportunities. And it might actually minimize the risk of wage theft, that is the misclassification of workers on these PLA projects with the workforce compliance programs discussed earlier. And for that reason, I hope that the PLA is applied to projects at the even less uh, lesser threshold of $1 million. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else online? We have no further speakers, Chair. Okay, I'll bring it back to the board. I just want to say that um, <clears throat> first, I want to just um, appreciate staff's work on this item um, and for the people who came out to speak today. Um, I do think that, um, you know, there's an opportunity right now, just based on the conversations they had to continue negotiating the project labor agreements with the county. And I think it's really critical 
that, you know, the county is working with the unions and under and a grant of their understanding the, the impacts of other communities. And I think that, you know, it's really important that we continue to do this um, so that we can get to some kind of mutually agreeable approach, whether that's a three-year blanket or whether it's a number of projects that that qualify that we're just going to select. Um, and I know that initially the direction was that we were going to move forward with 10 projects. And if we go in this kind of selection of project direction, I think that it would be good if we had five projects between 1 million and 5 million, and then five projects above 5 million, just to see how the breadth of um, PLAs can, can, can be carried out at those different price points. Um, personally, I think that, you know, there's a lot of information out there that we can work off of to draft just a blanket three-year PLA with that $1 million minimum. Um, but obviously it's a conversation, it's a decision that's going to be up to the board. Um, so I'll leave my comments there, but, you know, my hope is that, um, that we can you know, move forward with, you know, having staff go back and continue working on this with, with, um, with the union so that we can get to somewhere uh, where we're all comfortable. And so I'll see if there's any other board members who have any questions or comments or would like to make a motion. No, I got some questions and comments too. Um, so it was suggested that we do a three-year pilot and I think labor mentioned it was a, that they would like to see five years. I know that I actually spoke to Watson Mill, um, some of the folks on their engineering side, and we originally they were there, they looked at Berkeley, which was a seven-year uh, kind of pilot that they did. And then they eventually did another one. Um, but what's the difference? I like I I don't know. Like what's the difference between three year and five year? Like they're they're wanting. I I really don't know the difference. And then the other question is the consultant that they would use to oversee the project labor agreements is that third party or in house? And when we you when we uh, have normal contracts, do we have a third party or is it in house? Um. I think Justin mentioned a little bit, um, but I think Damon mentioned that small bids are under 1.5. It'd be nice if we could see maybe medium-sized projects, right, above that, that we could look at for the pilot project. Uh, but overall, I really agree with Supervisor Zach Friend's um, statement about, you know, needing more collaboration. Did we bring it to prime time? Something like that. Any words to his mouth? <laughs> but yeah, those are my three questions. Um, yeah. So I can answer some of those. Um, in terms of the three versus five years, it, it we can pick whatever you like. A three year would allow us to say we're going to measure in in a pilot structure for a period of time, with then the idea that we would bring something back, and the decision would be how do you want to expand this? How do what have you what have you learned? So I mean, it's from a staff perspective, it's more about having a contained amount of time before you make a significant change to expand it, contract it, whatever you choose to do. But we're, we're fine with three or five. I mean, I think that's, that's an, definitely something to discuss. I want to stress, we had one meeting with trades. The intention was not to negotiate a PLA for today. That was not what we were asked to do. We were asked to come forward with a report on non-responsibility, we're asked to come forward with projects. We did say we'd like to defer that to April, so about six weeks from now. Um, but And then we wanted to bring forward what are some key policy questions we need directions from you all to inform us coming forward with a an agreement. And of course, we would be talking with key stakeholders between now and whenever you want us to come forward. Oh, so your last question, though, was around consultant. I'm going to let yes. Damon talk about that and this the idea of a consultant resource for um, the PLA coordination function. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Like in house or, or third party, and I think there's different normal models. projects. Normal projects that without PLA, is there in house or is it third party? So typically, okay. So without a PLA, we're administering the projects primarily in house with our project management team. Um, we did do a little bit of outreach with other jurisdictions, and there's different models, but what we're proposing is to have it be a, a, a consultant. So it would be a third-party consultant that would be doing the uh, project labor coordination. So it's additional oversight, or is that just... It, it would be additional, okay. And sometimes <clears throat> some jurisdictions have hired for that internally. So they have someone who's basically collecting the data 
from the contractor so you would see how things are playing out in terms of compliance with the policy goals. So our, our recommendation is for, in a project scenario, we wouldn't be building a new function within the county, but we would be bringing that on as part of the project costs as a third-party consultant. And I guess, alluding to uh, Supervisor Zach Friend's uh, statement, I think that we do need more collaboration amongst, you know, the labor unions from here to end of April, uh, before you guys come back again, um, have more discussion with all the parties interested, right? Absolutely. All right, Mr. Chair, I'm going to try and formulate a motion here. I'm just going to move that we reject staff's recommendations. This isn't a rejection of your work. It's just in order to ensure that this uh, kind of starts a little bit blank slate and that you um, you coordinate with some of the, the folks that are here today and, and actually broaden your outreach to include uh, others um, and that you come back in June with revised recommendations uh, as a result of that. Second. So a new motion that's put forward by Supervisor Friend, seconded by Supervisor Hernandez, um, more or less for staff to go work with key stakeholders and bring back recommendations. And I, I guess the first meeting in June, is that, or whenever? Yeah, I'm, I don't have the master calendar in front of me to have a sense of what the extent of but the, the meeting that's the least impacted in June would be the preferred uh, meeting for a discussion of this magnitude. Thank you. That might be the second meeting since I think we have last day of the first meeting in June. Okay. So. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none, I'll turn it over to the clerk for a roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? And Cummings? Aye. So that passes unanimously. I couldn't hear McPherson, but I'm assuming that was an I. Okay, so that passes unanimously. And with that, that concludes our regular um, business today. And so we have one more item on the agenda, um, which is our closed session item, uh, conference with legal counsel, existing litigation. Just want to ask if there's if we anticipate having to report anything out of closed session. No. Okay. With that, I want to thank everybody for coming today, and we look forward to seeing you at our next meeting. Uh, which will be the first meeting in March. So thank you all and we'll see you soon.